Hey everybody, Padawan J here. I uh, just wanted to jump in before the start of the episode and uh, give everybody a heads up. The thoughts, and views, and opinions upcoming are that of Coach Duffy uh, and do not necessarily reflect that of the ODPH. The listener discretion is advised. Uh, in case any of you are familiar with what happened on Sunday, given the uh, NFC East or NFC Least, uh, you are very familiar with how hot Coach Duffy's going to be. So if you're listening with kids, uh, might not be a good idea. Don't know. I'm recording this before we actually record the physical episode, so I'm not going to slip it into the episode without him knowing. So yeah, thanks for listening and uh, listener discretion is advised. From the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking sports locally and nationally. Join the conversation on our social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Instead of looking deep inside, every word I have to say, keep it simple. Welcome back to another edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken. I'm joining me in studio. As always, you know him. He is the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. And also joining us in studio, senior sports editor of the ODPH. He is your coach. He is my coach. He is the coach! Coach Duffy. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Ah, it was. I've come to talk to you again. I was gonna message on Saturday <laughs> and say, "Bro, are you gonna be able to make it here?" Because I it know was a long, long weekend. And then Sunday hit, so obviously trying to ask about the week. Let's skip that and let's just get right into business, shall we? I just got one question: Did you do like a lot of people do and boot up NCAA whatever the last one was, fourteen? 15. I actually did I you do, boot, did you boot it up and blow Alabama out by like ninety? Dude, it's a funny. I actually have that game uh, and do play it still regularly. And I actually got my son Finn is now playing it. So, oh, there oh, you go. Nice. Yeah, he plays it on easy, and it's actually sure, sure. it's pretty fun to watch. It's it's he I so it's the one button push. Oh, okay. So and I just taught him the read option. Oh, so he's getting he's getting there. But uh, no, I didn't I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I I have done that in years past. I did do that after the. Uh, uh, the Clemson game. That's I fair. Take it to them. That's fair. There's going to be a lot of fans doing that after this week, too, of, of football. So definitely let's jump into the episode and give them something to talk about, shall we? Hit us up on that social media. You can find us all at OchoDuroParlayHour.com. So definitely join in on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you need to chat with us because, hey, we like to interact with you. And always remember to use the hashtag ODPH. Since we got a lot to discuss, let us kick off with the final locks and leaps of 2020 season i don't know how you like it's so weird saying it but we're now finally at week 17 so this is true had kick us off yeah so we're gonna start with my lock uh i chose the atlanta or excuse me the tampa bay uh buccaneers to defeat the atlanta falcons because hey i figured pretty easy uh and the uh, tampa bay buccaneers did winning by the final score of 44 to 27 uh tom brady 26 of 41 for 399 yards passing uh four touchdowns one interception matt ryan 29 of 44 for 265 yards passing uh two touchdowns zero interceptions coach your thoughts you know, the goddamn Falcons. Yeah. <laughs> the fans are saying the same thing. What what can you say, you know? It's just it's the same shit. It's the same shit. It's another week. Yeah. I mean, I uh, Ken and I both know somebody who is a Falcons fan who I saw that in post. You know, hey, season's finally over, nothing more than what I expected. You know, here's to next year and hopefully they'll get five wins. You what? know, and, and here's the funny thing too is that Tampa Bay didn't need to do much. No. No. They, they were no. just decisive. Yeah. And that's I mean, we're we're gonna get into it, but uh, you know, I'm thankful uh, that it's not going to be the Giants that have to play them next week because they're clicking right now. Yes, it's true. Tampa Bay did what Tampa Bay was supposed to do. They came in and did business. Atlanta. I mean, who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? 
Burn Awful it, is what burn, they are. Burn it down is what it is. Oh, they're going to need to. I mean, if they don't do it this offseason, there's no hope for that franchise. Well, I already I saw a lot of like message boards and all this stuff. Like a lot of people are tying Julio Jones to like varying different teams. Sure, uh, Matt Ryan, varying different teams. Like I've seen a lot of names just associated to other teams. So at this stage, you have to. There's no redemption factor. There's no happy ending for the team that went to the Super Bowl and, quite frankly, never came back the same way. This is the easiest way to describe them. They have so much talent on both sides of the ball, but they're mentally weak, and they're fragile, and they got exposed yet again. Obviously, this game, Tampa didn't need to do much, but Tom Brady wanted to try to make one final statement that they are, quote-unquote, the real deal in the NFC. He also so, wanted to help Antonio Brown get a few uh, extra dollars. Yeah, I, was, I saw that, too. He, you know, Antonio <laughs> Brown needed like a couple catches, a couple yards, or something like that, and he would have gotten a big uh, payday. And, well, he needed like – he needed 11 – he needed – 10 catches, and they yep. finished with 11 yep. for him to get, like, an extra $10,000, $50,000 bonus. I'll say in three of those catches were shovel yeah, passes. Yeah, to the point where, yeah, he was like, oh, we need to get these catches in. So it was shovel pass. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, Tampa didn't take this game seriously, nor should they. No. I mean, the major thing about Week 17, for anybody that's not too familiar with football, you either do one of two things. You either play for a playoff spot, or you're just playing not to get hurt. Right. Tampa, or you're paying to throw a game. Well, we'll get into that a little bit. Oh, we'll, yeah. we're, we're saving that one yeah. for last, my friend. But for Tampa, all they wanted to do is make sure that they locked up as much as they could trying to get the number one seed and trying to get into a position for the number one seed, I should say, rather. Because right. obviously there was a lot of moving parts going on that weekend, and obviously trailing the Saints was not going to help. And, you know, there was a lot of weird mathematics going on. I'll say I saw Sunday uh, on the Fox Sunday kickoff show that there were 148 different scenarios for uh, teams to get into the playoffs on Sunday. Yeah, it was just it was absolutely wild. So, like I say, for them, they just wanted to make a statement that they were the number one seed for mm-hmm. the game. Like I say, I don't think mathematically they had a real shot. No, I, th- I think at this point it was just a matter of it was not very much seeding. They won. It's not like if they got a win or a couple, or a couple other teams lost, they would have jumped up like three spots. It was just a matter of they stay at six or fall as low as maybe like eighth or ninth. Yeah, it was just something really weird about that. Because, yeah. I mean, obviously, taking a look, they would have been as close to number two as they could have been. Because yeah. with, with now finishing the season with 11 and five, they were never going to catch Green Bay. No. But it was going to be something like, well, maybe we could snuck one in on the Saints, and then who knows what would happen there. It's just like I say, the probability with it is just so crazy. But for Tom Brady, obviously coming to the NFC, he wants to establish that he is the true number one seed. Yeah. I mean, that's the point I'm trying to get with this. Because obviously kicking Atlanta's ass as bad as they have done. It's almost second nature for him now. Yeah, I mean, it's just there's certain players. You talk about when LeBron went to Toronto. Yeah, it's yeah. like, uh, you know, guaranteed two wins. Yeah, Tom Brady playing Atlanta, it's going to be two wins. Yeah. yeah. So obviously the streak continues. Tampa's getting ready for the playoffs. Atlanta is getting ready to implode the team. And then we go from there. So let's get to coaches, locks, and leaps because we are saving the best for last for this one. Uh-huh. So, Pat, break it down for us. Yeah, so Coach, uh, for his lock, decided to take the Cleveland Browns to defeat the Pittsburgh Steelers, which they did by the final score of 24 to 20, or t- yeah, 24 to 22. Uh, Baker Mayfield, 17 of 27 for 196 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Mason Rudolph, 22 of 39, uh, 315 yards passing, two touchdowns, one interception. Coach? Yeah, I mean, any I saw that they were – Sitting Ben, mm-hmm. yep. big Ben, yep. Pittsburgh. So yep. and this is a must-win game for Cleveland to get into the playoffs. So I said, why not? And you know what? They almost blew it. Well, so. and, you, and you know the wild stat I saw, and I didn't see this until Monday, uh, since Baker Mayfield has been drafted by the Cleveland Browns, the Steelers have not won a game in Cleveland. They're 0-2-1. Really? Uh-huh. And this is with Ben and without Ben, obviously. They have not won a game in Cleveland since they uh, Cleveland drafted Baker Mayfield. Is something about the rivalry of Cleveland and Pittsburgh since the Browns came back oh, after, yeah. after oh, they yeah. left Baltimore? That yeah. I don't know how else you can describe it other than Cleveland is cursed. Yeah. But this game, they somehow pulled some magic out. I don't know where. I don't know what they had to do to get there. And obviously, it was a huge win for that franchise in many varying degrees. Yeah, I would say this game was a lot closer than I thought it'd be because as soon as I read – Big Ben was getting benched in favor of Mason Rudolph. I was like, well, this game's an easy win for Cleveland. Right. Well, that's why, I mean, low-hanging fruit. That's why I picked it. Oh, sure. Cleveland Cleveland had to win. Sure. The thing that's concerning to me was that they almost let Pittsburgh get back into the game when Pittsburgh Uh has not been playing very well. Uh That's what was like, yikes. So, yeah, were they up 10-6 at halftime, and then, you know, the only score 
twice in the second half, whereas Pittsburgh puts up a field goal in the third quarter and then 13 points in the fourth quarter. Yeah, it was just one of those situations where Cleveland, on paper, should should have won a lot more games this season. Obviously, yeah, I was saying, and Cleveland's definitely going to step up its defense. I know you pointed it out when we were out watching some games. There was one point in the game, I think it was when Juju ca- uh, caught a big pass or it was a touchdown pass or something, where uh, Pittsburgh came out with an empty backfield. Yeah, and it was like, all right, you know what they're doing at that point, and well, lo and behold, Juju was on single coverage. Yeah, exactly. Their reaction to change. On the and you know on the fly there was non-existent and they're just lucky they held on. Yeah. But obviously when you have two of the best running backs in the league, mm-hmm. Nick Chubb and even Kareem Hunt, who is doing more you know catching than uh, yeah. you know yeah well they're decoying I should had, say had rather to. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah he, he kind of yeah. had to I mean obviously ten yard or ten carries for thirty seven yards wasn't really going to do but he is still a factor when he's in the game like I said being a decoy that takes a lot of pressure off Baker mm-hmm. and Nick Chubb obviously running for hundred and eight and a touchdown that helps too. So for them, Cleveland is going to need to rely on them. And with Pittsburgh even sitting starters, the fact that this game was as close as it was, obviously yeah. you, we I talk about this all the time. It's division. doesn't matter. They're going to step up for their rival. Oh, sure. And for Pittsburgh, I don't think that they were sweating Cleveland that much, and that's no. why they felt about sitting their starters. Take nothing away. Cleveland did win this outright, so they deserve to get in the playoffs. Yeah. This isn't something in the latter game that we'll discuss. Right. But it's something with Pittsburgh that I don't think they were sweating Cleveland making it in there and facing them again. But right. this is where next week is going to come to be so monumental because the Browns and Steelers have to play each other yet again. Uh, this time in Pittsburgh. Right. So it's going to be a whole different Tough. ball of wax. Yeah, uh-huh. so tough. Uh-huh. And the odds are already stacked against them because their head coach and uh, some other coaches were diagnosed with COVID as we were just jumping on the record. Well, I saw it. Or COVID problem protocol. Yeah, I, well, saying. I saw that they're potentially looking to move it. Ooh. The NFL's talking. So, interesting. Well, that, interesting. W- that will be an interesting precedent if they do. I mean, obviously this year, still carrying over from 2020, we are in a lot of uncharted water. Well, I think it's just the difference is the playoffs now. Oh, I agree. You know, like, I mean, they got they have to do the right thing for, you know, competitive balance. Right? Oh, yeah, no, fully. I agree, I agree right. with you about that. I mean, so. and they got some time to play with it and then kind of see where things go because currently as we record, it is scheduled to take place on Sunday uh, at 8.15, so it's the last game of the weekend. So they so they got some time. They they should definitely make some adjustments for that. I think just for the interest of fairness. I don't, the problem is I just don't. I mean, they were today is Tuesday as we record. So, uh, I don't, the protocol would be I think that they if they test again, I think they test again on Saturday right. that they would be cleared for Sunday night. But if they don't test again until Sunday, then they would have to play it Monday. I it's would, like it's all dependent on I, the protocol is tough. It's it all depends on that. I would have to guess that they would do quicker testing. For I'll say yeah. Just, well, I'll say yeah. The problem is though is it's not it's not the results. It's the sure. timing. Right. No. The, no. I, yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, right. But that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. I think that wherever the earliest window is to do right. it, they would. Bump. Yeah. They're, they they're gonna nick save in this. Yeah. They're yeah. absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Gonna do oh, yeah. That. So that's what I say. So it's hard to tell what's gonna happen with this, but Cleveland has a lot of stuff going against them, and that's why right. I said with Pittsburgh. The fact that they still hung in there yeah. was a testament to the team, even though it was Mason Rudolph leading it. It yeah. wasn't Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah. So now when we play each other uh, down the next week, it's going to be a whole different dynamic that they're going to have to deal with. But for Cleveland, this is a huge confidence booster. You have to take it as a win. Right. They held on. Granted, it's still Pittsburgh, so it's still that name win. Mm-hmm. It's still something that Baker needed to get over the hump and actually look like he's the number one draft pick that he was all those years ago, and he's the guy that can lead Cleveland into the playoffs. Now, how far they go, anybody's guess. It's the playoffs. It doesn't, oh, yeah. ma- it doesn't matter about your records prior to. It's a matter of your records moving forward. Mm-hmm. So let's see what happens when they play that game. Yep. Uh, and then Coach's Leap was the Carolina Panthers to beat the New Orleans Saints, and that did not happen. Uh, New Orleans won by the final score of 33-7. Drew Brees, 22 of 32 for 201 yards passing, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater, 13 of 23, 176 yards passing, no touchdowns, two interceptions. And note, there's a lot of players that weren't playing for the Saints well, as well. And that's, why I, uh-huh. that's why I went with oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, the, uh, the entire running back core was out. And Alvin Kamara has been such a huge part of this, you know, resurgence that this uh, New Orleans offense has gone through the last, you know, three or four weeks. So I, I, I thought to myself, this is, sure. this is a must. And plus, you know, I thought Carolina would come out and try and perform. I mean, New Orleans, argue, you know, their their chase to get the number one seed was like a win 
and a shit ton of help. Yeah. So well, I yeah. almost thought they would yeah. kind of just defer it because, like, what's the point of chasing this at this level? Um, but nope. <laughs> Obviously, they came out and put a whooping on them. I'll say down all all their running backs, but still Ty Montgomery, 18 carries, 105 yards, no touchdowns. You know, Drew Brees spread the ball around. Emmanuel Sanders, nine catches, 63 yards, one touchdown. Who also had a $500,000 bonus if he had yep. X amount of catches. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jared Cook, uh, their tight end, four catches for 43 yards, one touchdown. Uh, Marquez Calloway, three catches, 51 yards, no touchdown. You know, so he spread the ball around. He definitely spread the ball around. And like I say, there was going to be a lot of dynamics going in. Like I say, I know I got Tampa Bay mixed up earlier. Yeah. When I was thinking about, but there were so many different dynamics for some team to get the number well, one yeah. seed in the NFC. Yeah. That it was like, okay, I think everybody was in the race for it. And obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah. Green Bay, all Green Bay had to do was win. Right. Uh, and then uh, both New Orleans and Seattle were still in it, but they needed Green Bay to lose. They needed to win their games and the other two teams to lose for them both to get Yeah, like it was such a wild scenario. It was like everybody was involved at one point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why I was like, I didn't think that with, you know, Drew Brees coming off the broken ribs, all this other stuff, like I didn't think they would try to pursue it. I knew he would play, mm-hmm. but I didn't think that they would legitimately run him the entire game. So that's what I was banking on. Broken ribs, smoking ribs. You look at his Instagram post, he's got the best crack medical team uh, looking at his ribs possible. It's, it's a spoiler alert, it's his kids. Yeah, and you know, with, with Brees, he knows this is the final run. Yeah, so y- yeah, you know he's gonna. There are those rumors. Yeah, and obviously at his age, it makes sense that yeah. he. What else are you gonna do? You're in the best position with this team that it's in a, a place where if you decide to leave, they're not gonna be sinking. They're still gonna stay afloat next year. Yeah, and he just strikes me as one of those types where he's gonna want to go out gunslinging. Yeah, you know, throwing the ball all over, all over the yard. He's not gonna want to go out looking like he just kind of coasted into the playoffs. Oh, exactly. So for them. They definitely need to do that, and they did. And going into the playoffs, they're still the scariest team you're going to face in there. Yes. The fact they did this without any running back core, and granted, I get it, it's Carolina. Carolina is not a good team. No. Still speaks volumes of how the Saints run efficiently, and they're going to be a very, very scary team moving Saints forward. the epitome of next man up. Exactly. And the culture that they built down there, I mean, Sean Payton and company have really made it the Saints way. I know it's, you know, deferring right. about the Patriots way, right, but right. let's face no, yeah, it. Yeah, you're right. Let's face it. I mean, that's how it is with it. So yeah. the Saints, yeah. we'll have to see what happens when they start going into the playoffs. I do not want to face them first round. Oh, and, hell no. And for Carolina, well, it's the off season, so. You say you did better than I think we all figured you would. I thought they'd do a little better. I mean, obviously they had a lot of injuries, so you, oh, yeah. you, you yeah. have to factor that into play. Yeah, I mean, Bridgewater missed uh, a second half of a game. Um, right. Christian McCaffrey was in now the lineup, I think that yeah, yeah. you know, and then obviously the Coakley retirement. Yeah. You know, I don't think that gets talked about enough. I mean, you had your cornerstone uh defensive player, you know, your your quarterback of your defense up and retire like a week or two before training camp started. Yeah. You can't, you know, and, and you know, you go into that and you got Matt Rule, a rookie head coach coming in thinking that sure. hey, I'm gonna at least have, you know, that piece of my defense to up and retire, you know, that late in the in the retirement. Right. Um, you know, I guess that it's really no different than some of the guys that bailed on, you know, as far as sitting out the year, you know, for COVID. But that's tough. It is For tough. a rookie head coach. Well, it's a back-breaking moment. It's like when Andrew Luck decided to leave. Yeah. Right. For yeah. Indianapolis. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that was Absolutely. the easiest way to remind me. Yeah. So you knew that mental block was going to be around you that entire season because when you have a player such as Keekly leave – you don't fill that void easy. Yeah, it's yeah. tough. It's it's extremely tough. So Carolina tried to water. I mean, obviously they're still better than Atlanta, and they <laughs> did what they needed to. <laughs> nice. It, Come on, that's a low bar. It's a low bar, but still, I try to give them something to reach for. That's true. So we'll have to see what they do in the off season then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna switch over to your lock, uh, where you chose the Green Bay Packers to defeat the Chicago Bears, and they did by the final score of thirty-five to sixteen. A. A. Ron Rodgers, uh, nineteen of twenty-four for two hundred and forty yards passing, four touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Maserati Mitchell Trubisky, thirty-three of forty-two for two hundred and fifty-two yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception. Coach, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, this was a similar situation that I thought Green Bay, you know, felt they were going to be comfortable in the one seed, especially they were, you know, the four o'clock game, so they were playing the same time as the Saints. But I mean, I still thought that they might. I, I honestly thought Jordan Love was going to play a little bit. I, I thought know, so I, I thought at least get a, a snap or two, but you know, to and especially with Green Bay being in a position that they basically controlled their own destiny to um, have the one seed. Yeah. But then 
playing Rodgers the whole time are dangerous. <laughs> well, yeah, dangerous. And I figured, like you, they'd go maybe like what Buffalo did with Josh Allen, where go up enough, you know the game's in hand, and then swap them out. But you look at halftime, uh, Green Bay was only up 21 to, what is that, 12, 13. So not, a, not, not entirely out of reach. But then uh, Chicago only scored three points the entire rest of the second half, whereas Green Bay put up 14 in the fourth quarter. So you would have, I would have figured – Fourth quarter, all right, we're up big. Even even if it was after the you know the, the first uh, touchdown of the fourth quarter, you'd be like, all right, we're up big. Let's pull out Rodgers and put Jordan Love in because we don't want Rodgers hurt. But I think with the number one seed still up for grabs, and Green Bay just needed to win and bring it home. Yeah, that there was that side of Aaron Rodgers that he wanted to be the the closer. He didn't want Jordan or Love to be his closer, a la Miami. Yeah, he wanted to finish that out right. Well, and obviously, with the Bears, you know that that's the biggest rivalry they got. This is true. I think it also comes to the fact that it's Aaron, you know Aaron Rodgers won. He's I mean he's got stats on stats on stats this year. Mm-hmm. I mean he's For putting days. Up, yeah he's got he's got numbers that are. Second to none right now. What so. the hell was the one stat I saw that he's got more touchdown passes than what was it like fumbles or something bizarre like that? He I saw because I saw a couple bizarre stats over the last couple of days. He's got some bizarre stat where he's got more touchdown passes than maybe drop passes or something bizarre. It's something. Dude, weird. he's got he's thrown five interceptions. He's he, got forty eight touchdowns. He has that's something stupid. It's something like forty-eight touchdowns to forty-six drop passes. It's not, yeah, that's what it's it is. Something that's ridiculous, dumb. But that's what Rodgers does. I no, mean, I mean that that yeah. those numbers. That's crazy. Uh, we both got it wrong. Aaron Rodgers has got more touchdown passes than punts the Packers have done that's all right. year. That's fucking wild. He's got yeah. forty-eight touchdown passes. The oh Packers, the Packers for the entire season punted forty-six times. And you, you're sitting here t- trying to tell me that you needed to draft a quarterback because you were afraid he was done. Exactly. That's nuts. That's what the Green Bay mentality is. I'm sorry. I know we have Green Bay listeners out there. Shout out to JVD from Crossover Collision, but. It is wild to think that the organization thought Rodgers was done. Your organization's fucking stupid, and you just get lucky. And I said it, JVD. I'm sorry, bro, but, like, dude. Well, and also Rodgers finishes the season with a uh, quarterback passer rating of 121 That's points. That's fucking nuts. 121.5. Yeah. Oh, my God. Only other better season in, in NFL history, Aaron Rodgers in 2011 when it was 122.5. Yo, and Jordan Love wasn't even, like, the guy. Like, no, it's he not wasn't even the like, guy. You know, like, it's not like you were pursuing somebody that was like, all right, Roger, you know. Rogers low-key went fuck you mode. Yeah. yeah. No, he. I mean, we knew, we said it going we into the year that year. it was going to be this. But, like, this is this is next level F you mode. Like, yeah. this is, this is, I'm going to literally, I'm going to dump it on you, and then I'm going to leave and watch the dumpster fire after I'm gone. Exactly. This is where he is wanting to make a statement that he's going to win this championship Cause what by do you himself. Do? What do you do? What do you do next year? You, you, do you say, all right, Rodgers, you, you're like, the difference with the Rodgers-Brett uh, Favre thing was that year, like, Brett Favre, he sat for a couple of years, sure. but Favre was declining. You know, yeah. like, his play, his level of play, especially that Giants game, um, you know, was not very good. No. Um, and you could see the athleticism start to slowly fade and, and the ball speed, all that stuff. Like, yeah. the, the, the level of play wasn't there. You're literally getting a guy now coming off of a career year Going into the off season, what are you going to say? All right, you know we're going to turn the keys over to Love and, and let you go, Rogers. Hey, Rogers, uh, there's an opening up in the Massachusetts area if you're looking yeah, to come somewhere. Tongue, like, you. like it would have been, you know, it was different with the Andrew uh, Luck Peyton Manning thing because Peyton Manning was coming off that major surgery. Sure, sure. They, you know, they had no idea right. what they were going to get. Sure, Andrew Andrew Luck's coming in, generational quarterback. You got to make that move. Oh, absolutely. But, like you absolutely. literally now are going into this off season. You're like. Shit, we still we Rock still got hard the guys. Place. You burned your your draft pick. That's the only thing I can take away yeah. from it because Rodgers controls his own destiny. There's a if, lot of cap space in New England. Oh, you stop that nonsense right now. Well, not hear this. Blast They're not. Me. Listen. Yeah. No. If, if you get anybody, you're going to get Jordan Love. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you're you, not, you might get Jordan. You're not Love. getting Aaron Rodgers. They're going to kiss his feet. Here is a nice bonus. We are sorry. We are. You're smart. We're dumb. You're handsome. We're slightly less attractive than you. That's the talk that they're going to have with Rodgers. They're going to need to because he's going to single-handedly run them into the playoffs. Yep. It's all on him. Their defense doesn't scare anybody. Their defense oh, fuck no. Garbage. No, yeah. but the fact that you have him in that backfield and he can just tear you apart by himself. He's a one-man team. 
Well, nobody I is. I mean, Devontae Parker's pretty good. Parker's too. good. Or Adams. Or Devontae, Adam, yeah, Devontae yeah. Adams is good. He's a pretty good wide receiver. He's, oh, good. Yeah. He's good. He helps. But listen, <laughs> Rod- Rodgers has been doing this so long by himself. With He makes other players great. That's Lef- the thing. That's the a sign of a shout, right. chicken salad out of chicken shit. Dude, exactly. And the even crazier thing is LaFleur now looks like a genius. Oh, my God, yeah. And he... Is he calling the plays? Is he not calling the plays? Like, no. do we he's actually su- he's know? Su- he's suggesting the plays. It's up to Rogers yeah. whether he wants he's, to do it or not. He's saying, "Hey, Aaron, can can, can maybe you want to run it here? I don't know. Yeah, can, can we can, can we run the ball in this play?" And Rogers like, "No, this is the we'll epi- this is the epitome of if you're playing Madden and you do the whole ask Madden, see what he says thing. You, you know, get, Rogers, and you go, not, yeah, right. You this know, is Rogers, the, hey babe, what are we having for dinner tonight? You know, can, can you pick? Because I don't want to pick tonight. No, you know what this is. This is Rogers literally turning off his microphone and his helmet, turning on his favorite <laughs> Spotify soundtrack, oh. and just playing and just saying like, "Okay, what are we going to do?" That is literally. It's like when Peyton Manning's offensive coordinator all those years in Indianapolis, yeah, just would sit there and, and hold the clipboard because, like, literally, I, what are you going to do? Hey, hey, I can't hear you. I, what are you? What are you? What are you asking? I'm, I'm going I, through, I can't hear. I'm you. Going through a tunnel. Exactly. He's just listening to his favorite tunes. He's good. He's like he's in the huddle. He's laughing. He's you taking know. his helmet off on. It's just not working. Yeah. Sorry. He's like sorry. It's, I took a hit. I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I just have to make this up on my own. What do you think, That's he's, how what do you think he's listening to? He strikes me as maybe a Run DMC guy. Ah, uh, that's a good question. JVD, no, I know you're listening. You have to hit us. He's probably an 80s, 70s rock guy. I could see him listening to Bob Seger. Oh. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I could definitely see him doing that. Working on some night. Yeah, like I definitely see something like that. Yeah. But while he's throwing four touchdowns and pr- not throwing an interception. We need to appreciate his greatness while he's here. He and, threw mm-hmm. he threw as many touchdowns in one game as he has interceptions. Yep. yep. It, it's it's mind blowing what he can do. Like I say, please stay away from New England. I don't want to see you in the AFC East. But you can do whatever you want. Let it happen. Hey, we well, I mean, they would have to bring all wide receiver over because he, I mean Adams is pretty goddamn good. Yeah, no, he's got he's got a great wide receiver in Adams, and he can definitely make good players great. That's what they're going to need to do for these playoffs. To flip the coin to Chicago, the fact that they backed in because Arizona, uh, unfortunately, did not make it. Yep. How far are they going to go? I think they're one and done. Yeah. You know, the thing with Chicago is, is Trubinsky was playing much better football up until they ran into this Green Bay game. Yeah. So, yeah. like, yeah. their defense, if they get engaged – could mess around and possibly steal, you know, that opening round game, but it's not going to be easy. You know, I mean, with their offense not as good, um, it's got to be all on the defense. Yeah, I agree with and you. And their defense has not played well enough to be like, right, like the Baltimore's like defenses where you were like, oh yeah, yeah, Baltimore, their defense is going to win this game. Like that's not the Chicago defense. They're good and they have the potential to, right, but they're not playing to that level. They're all potential. That's the thing about them. But are they going to be consistent enough to make a deep run? No. Sadly, I don't, I just don't see it no, happening. It, no, it's, it's a one and done. No, it's definitely going to be a one and done. I mean, they just don't have that defensive lockdown. They, they don't strike fear. Even Khalil Mack in there. They don't strike that much fear. No. Yeah. I mean, they, they should, though. That's hey, the oh, thing. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah oh, they yeah. should. But they just, they're not right now. On, on paper, it's one thing. But then you go and you watch the game tape, and you're like, oh, they're not as scary as we thought they'd be. Exactly. And the fact that I believe they have New Orleans first round? Uh, Correct. So. Yeah, it's one and done. So enjoy this week going into it, but after that, ah, it ain't going to be pretty. It's like when Binghamton University played Duke in the first round of the NCAA tournament. It's like, hey, thanks for showing up. Bye. We were there for a quarter. Yep. That's all we needed. Yep. But speaking of quarters, though. Oh, boy. We have to go to my leap. Uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the co-main event of the evening here, folks. Yes. So I took those New York football giants uh-huh. over those Dallas Cowboys. Uh-huh. And, Pad, what happened? Uh, the New York Football Giants won by the final score of 23-19. to 19. Uh, Daniel Jones, 17 of 25 for 229 yards passing, two touchdowns, one interception. Andy Dalton, 29 of 47 for 243 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception. Coach, take it away. First off, the, they literally, the Giants did, and the refs a little bit, did everything they could to give this game to the Cowboys. I agree. Because... There was some there were some very very bad calls that broke the Giants back on a couple of key drives that the Giants could have scored on. Right. And then Evan Ingram of himself oh. tried blowing this game for the Giants. This so this I'm in a couple group, you know, Giant I got some Giants friends in a couple, you know, Facebook groups or whatever. Yeah. And the talk was it's insane in a year when 
players aren't playing in the Pro Bowl. Sure. Because so I've all, I've said on the show before that the Pro Bowl really means nothing to me because it's at a, the end of the day, contest. right? Not only is it that, but you guys sit, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. You know, ex player from B team that had no business making it makes it because yeah. you know the guy who should be in it's opting not to play. Yeah, um, for whatever reason, you know. So the Pro Bowl never meant much, but this year the Pro Bowl meant a little bit more to me because a the coaches vote meant more, sure. and they're not playing. Sure, so they're literally voting for players that they feel deserve to be there. Sure, yeah. okay, sure. Evan Ingram is a Pro Bowl. Mm-hmm. Blow, like, wrap your mind around that real quick. The guy who literally single handedly almost wrecked this game against the Cowboys by having two drops, one that led into an interception. Uh, quickly, stats, uh, just in case you're, you're, none of you are Giants fans like myself and Ken and don't know his stats. Uh, Evan Ingram for the year, 63 catches, which was tied for 40th, uh, 654 yards. Uh, cat passing, uh, he caught for 62nd in the NFL. One touchdown, which was tied for 126th, and then he averaged 10.4 yards per catch, which was 100th in the league. Dude, he's a big athletic tight end. That when he came out of Ole Miss, everybody was like, "This is the next. This is the evolution of tight end." Sure, this is he's going to be that. You can split him out. You can put him in the slot. You can put him at tight end. You can do so many different things with him. The Giants are getting a gem here. They, I think, they got him at like the 23rd pick. And, you know, the rookie season played well. Sophomore season had a little bit of the slump. Then the junior year, he had the broken foot, so he was out for a duration of the season. You know, and then he comes back on this fifth year or fourth year, and I'm like, what do we have here? What do we have? Like, you have a guy who's inconsistent at best, dropping catch. Like I understand, you know, dropping difficult passes because, like, it's not easy. It's just not easy. But a wide open with the ball hitting you in the hand is unexplainable. It's unforgivable. And he did that multiple times. Then Wayne Goldman. We'll say the ass recovery. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, dude, talk about something that was just like, I'm literally, I'm running. Because, I mean, at this point, I'm celebrating. I'm like, oh, my God, the Giants are going to steal this. Like, right. they're going to actually do this. Right. I'm, I'm running through my house. And, you know, Aaron had picked the Cowboys. So she was, like, livid because, you know, I picked the Cowboys, too. Reverse psychology because ah, I picked yeah. the Giants. I had picked ah. the Giants the last three weeks, and I was like, "No, no, no, no! I'm the Jinx. I'm going to pick the Cowboys." I tried telling her she didn't listen, but I picked the Cowboys because I'm like, "All right, I'm going to put my bad juju on them," you know. And here comes the Giants. They're driving. Wayne Gallman gets the first down. Literally, as he gets the first down, I sprint out of my my living room into the kitchen. Just dan- you know, the high step in Deion Sanders. Ha ha ha! We won this game. I come back in and he's still standing. Yeah. I'm like, what do you go down? Yeah. Wayne, go down. Like yeah. I'm like Rocky. I'm like, let's sit the down. Lay down. I'm screaming at the TV and I knew, I knew he was gonna fumble. I knew it. I was like, there's no way a guy fights this hard for this extra yards in this situation of a game. This situation. Yeah. Under two minutes left to go, no timeouts left. Like I was like, they are he's gonna fucking fumble. Jalen Smith pops the ball out, and I'm like, God! Yeah. Why, God? Why? You know? And 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 sure enough, somehow, somehow he, he recovers, and I don't know how. He, he, he sat on it. Well, so here's the thing, though. Like, we watched, obviously, the Clemson-Ohio State game, and, the, and I kept thinking back to the Trevor Lawrence situation. Right. I kept thinking back to his hand was on the ball. He had his hand gripping on the ball, but not considered possession right so i'm thinking he's sitting on the ball that's not technically possession because he doesn't have control of it and the ball pops out it's not a football move it's not well not only is it not a football move but it doesn't show control if the ball pops out right so i'm like it's the cowboys ball i'm fucking i'm laying on my ground i'm laying on my carpet i thought i thought the same thing because ken and i were out watching the game and obviously the the giants came because there was a lot of giants fans there and they were all freaking out going up and i was like like oh it's, it's giants ball it's giants ball and i'm like no, didn't they rule it for the Cowboys? Yeah, and, 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 and the, ru- the initial ruling from one referee, not the umpire. Ah, that's what you got to pay attention to. The the official said Cowboys. The umpire said Giants ball. So that's what made the break for the Giants. Man, it was a stressful, stressful last and, 45 seconds of that game. And I got to say, that was also the second time that weekend I'd seen that exact same scenario because I want to say it was the Oregon, whoever the hell they were playing in the in the college football uh bowl game 
where it was in the Fiesta Bowl where similar fucking thing happened. Guy cut, it was either caught pass or a run or something, but like got the first down, digging, 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 digging. He's got like three, four defenders attack on him, and I'm like, dude, you're not going to get anywhere else. Just go down. Hey. And then sure as shit, kept digging, 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 and some guy came in there just went, pop, and out came the ball, fumbled and lost it. And the other thing I want to note, too, is to all the, the Giants fans or, or haters or whatever, you know, whoever you are, uh, Julian Love played corner, by the way, all game long, and absolutely shut out Michael Gallup. So he had one catch that I saw and remember with Julian Love specifically on him. So to all those people that were like, that, you know, maybe it gave me a little bit of flack or were like, oh, Julian Love's not fast enough to play corner in the NFL. Well, he's not, he doesn't have the speed. The guy was the best cover corner in college football and should have won the best corner of whatever that award is, the Jim Thorpe Award, in college, but it went to DeAndre Baker because SEC yeah, bias, yeah, yeah. and it should have been him, and look at what happened. Baker currently sure. was out of the NFL, even though he just got picked up by Kansas City, but was out of the NFL, right. and Julian Love now is the Giants' number two corner moving forward and should have been from the beginning. Just want to put that out there. But I'm very uh, the Giants. The, this game was a great game to watch. It it will be it. It won't go down as a classic because obviously it was like six to seven for most of the first half. But the second half, you know, points went up on the board. It was a great game, and it led into a very fun Sunday night. Yeah, I don't know if you want to call Sunday night fun, but we will drop some more f words involved in that one because <laughs> yeah. Pad. I what else can you really say about that Giants game other than? The Giants played their hearts out. Oh, they got absolutely. A lot. They got, they got absolutely. Like, Dallas, Dallas was game four, too. Both but teams. The, but the Giants were more hungry for it, I thought. Oh, absolutely. Except Evan Ingram, I think, was trying to write his way out of New York because <laughs> I haven't seen Evan that Ingr- many. Evan Ingram was trying to make the collective conscience of the United States forget the Mark Sanchez Dude, butt fumble. And it's yeah. so tough because I don't want to dislike him because I know there's such untapped potential. But when uh, Jason Garrett came to the Giants, my I said it on the show. I go... He is going to to turn Evan Ingram into the player that we thought he was going to be. Like that's what we thought. That's what we thought we were getting with Jason Garrett. And I and, and instead I, he regressed. Right. And I and I understand where you're coming with that. You definitely want to give a guy his due. You definitely want to give a guy time to develop and, and progress. It's the fourth year though. Fourth Exa- year. Exactly. At some point you got to realize. All right, we've hit the ceiling on this guy. It's not going to get any better. He's not going to show up to camp next year and all of a sudden be making one handed grads that would make George Kittle and, and Rob Gronkowski in his prime that, blush. That's the thing that I because I'm watching these games and I'm seeing George Kittle and I'm seeing. Gronk, and I'm seeing uh, Travis Kelsey, and I'm seeing, like, I don't think Evan Ingram is there, but he would be that next tier of tight end, like uh, uh, Zach Ertz, yeah. or what um, Jason Garrett did have in Dallas with... Uh, Not Witten, but... W- Witten, yeah, oh, Witten, what he had with Witten, um, you know, and, and those type of players, like, that's what tier I thought he was in, and could have been pushing those guys. Sure. And instead, I mean, he's Dallas Goder. He's got all the physical tools in the world, but he can't put them all together. No. Yeah. That's the thing about him. Whenever he, he gets out there, he has flashes. And we, I know I throw that word around a lot, flashes of brilliance, but it makes really, me it's it, flashes. It makes me miss Kevin Boss, the most unathletic, just hardworking tight end. The but Giants he can run routes. Had, but he can run routes. But he's not. he was absolutely the most unathletic tight end in the NFL at the time. Yeah. But you know what he did do? Caught the goddamn football. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's all you need to do with it. <laughs> I mean... So moving forward with that, I mean, the Giants definitely were waiting to see what happened Sunday night. Dallas was already figuring out excuses for what they were going to do for uh, next so season. They were but, giving Kellen Moore a stupid large extension. Yeah. For which, an offense that was like, meh. Well, it was anemic for the most part because they got away from Ezekiel it's, Elliott for the most part. And then once, I, like, granted, I understand when Dak went down, you had to change. I right. get that. I, I fully get that. But still, it was not the Dallas that was running the offense with Garrett. Like, say what you will about it, Garrett used to put up points all over the place. The, the thing is, like, that's so. This is what this is what blew my mind when they got it because the the story came out that he was potentially going to interview at Boise State, and I was like, that's a really good fit for him. Yeah, it's huge. that would be that would be a great fit. And then I saw that they signed him the extension, and I'm like, 
what is the obsession that Jerry Jones has with him? He is not the wonder good wonder kid. He has the offense that he runs has all the weapons in the world and put up 19 points on a Giants defense that had been playing pretty goddamn good but still could be taken for yeah, advantage right. of. And you mean to tell me that this is the wonder goo? Like, this is the wonder kid coming up? In my opinion, Jerry just has this obsession with his yes people. Yeah. Well, and, not- but he like he falls in love. It's, it's almost like wrestling with Vince McMahon. Sure. There's certain people that he just he knows will just go with him, and they do work that he feels is great, and he just won't let him go. Well, what, what it reminds me of, honestly, is the McAdoo situation with the Giants, is that they, they had an offensive coordinator that was in place that they tagged as the next head coach, and when the the regime was ready to be moved on, you know, even though they kind of forced Tom Coughlin out, they were they were ready to give it to McAdoo before he was ready. Um, but the giant, but the Giants did that because he was interviewing for other head coaching jobs. So they were like, "Keys to the car, here you go." We know you're you only got your permit, but we're gonna we're gonna let you right. we're gonna let you right. pass your road test. Yeah. But and that's exactly what like. I guarantee you Kellen Moore would have gotten the job in Dallas right now as the head coach had Mike McCarthy not probably had a solid interview with Jerry Jones. Oh, probably. Because there's no way you sign a guy to this extension with the way that this offense is playing and say, this is our guy. But that also goes to show, I mean, Jerry's abilities at GM. You know, that's the problem. Or when, lack thereof. Well, exactly. And, and I think that I think the big issue of it is, is Jerry wants to recreate what worked. He, he I know what works for this team and that was what he'd had in the in the nineties. Yeah, but with all that, but that doesn't work these days. It doesn't work because And he's got the, horse blinders to it. Well that's the thing. When you when you get seduced by past success and you live in the past, you don't see the present. This is Dallas one oh one, unfortunately. Yeah. Like I mean, let's not get it wrong. Do you need a good quarterback? Yes. Do you need a good running back? Yes. Does a good receiver help? Yes. Do you need to find Troy Aikman 2.0, you know, Emmett Smith 2.0 and, and, you know, receiver 2.0? No. Do you need three good, do you need three potentially great wide receivers that one you take in the first round when, you know, obviously your offensive line was looking like it was going to be good but not great and there's offensive linemen available? Do you need to take CeeDee Lamb in that draft? No. No. Could but, you have taken somebody in the secondary? Probably. You know, like so there's all these smaller moves that they could have done that like, yeah, they're they're trying to recreate that Michael Irvin, Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith, um, God, I forget the guy who's on the other side of Michael Irvin for all those years that you know, Terrell Owens wasn't on the opposite side of him, but I'm just saying names that Jerry, they've gotten. Jerry, Jerry, and that's what they do. Yeah, but Jerry likes a sexy pick. That's you know what yeah. he always does. You know what the, they are? I this is a great comparison. They are the two thousands Rangers. Yeah. Chasing yeah. Eric Lindros, yeah. chasing Scott Gomez, chasing Chris Drury, chasing all these names of guys you hope who to capture the magic. Yeah, you hope. Yeah, that you hope that you can get them on their last run, even though these guys are still young. And but you just don't get it. The Yankees from 2004 to like what 2000. There you go. Yeah, yeah exactly. The hell it was. When you get seduced by the past, that's the problem. And Jerry just can't get over the fact that the game has evolved, and he needs to address other positions. But he likes to get those flashy players to come in there, which, granted, some of them do pan out very well, and some of them really light up the yeah, stat I mean, CeeDee Lamb's going to be great. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like I say, I don't fault him for picking him. I fault him for where he picked him. That's the issue because you had other glaring holes that you needed. I mean, you got to fault him for picking him, though, because they didn't need him. It's well, it's, a, it's a spoils of the riches. Well, right. No, I agree with it. But that's what I'm saying with it. Like, I don't fault him for for getting him as a player. But right. I, I do fault him for, okay, we're going to burn our number one pick to get a position that we don't need. Right. That's right. why I'm saying yeah, that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, so that's why I say I mean, but that's what Dallas is doing. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's it's almost like the Dan Snyder thing. Meanwhile, the as, Giants have three slot wide receivers. Yeah. <laughs> wide receivers. Well, well, the Giants the Giants will be making some moves in the offseason, uh, trust me. And I think for their reaction to the next game that we're going to, I think is going to win them a lot more players than I think they realize. Devontae Smith. Please. It's Please. all possible because, like I said, Dallas's curse is the same as Washington's with Dan Snyder. And I think that that's the problems you have. But let us not wait any longer to talk Let's about that. It. That's another conversation. So ding, the last ding, ding. game, the main event, Pad, lead it away. Yeah, so I chose the Philadelphia Eagles to defeat the Washington Redskins. And uh, why don't we roll back the tape here a little bit and uh, from last week. 
Uh, and then my leap, I, I struggle with this one. There's a lot of games that and I just couldn't stomach going for my leap, but I figure this one I might have a shot with. Uh, looking at that Sunday night game, Washington currently favored by one and a half. Now, as we mentioned, Dwayne Haskins no longer with the Washington football team. Uh, Alex Smith is penciled in as their starter, asterisk if he can play. If he can't, uh, it's a gentleman by the name of Taylor Henneke, who is uh, in his fourth season out of Old Dominion. Uh, for his career, he has 467 passing yards and only two touchdowns with uh, 48 completed passes. I think if Alex Smith can't go and it's Taylor Henneke, Washington probably not going to win that game. Uh, so I think uh, Philly's going to be able to pull out the win. And re- re- I think they'll really want to play spoiler come Sunday night, given how the Giants-Cowboys game went. And just, oh, we really got a chance to mess with Washington's chances to, to make the playoffs here. Why don't we throw a, a wrench into that? Yeah, so those are the reasons I picked that game. And uh, while they uh, went in the complete, like, it didn't go wrong. It went in the, like, complete opposite direction down I-95. Uh, Washington won by the final score of 20-14. to 14. Uh, Alex Smith did end up playing the game. Although, and cool little fun fact uh, that his wife posted on Instagram before uh, the game during the day. Uh, they, she, they took his leg brace contraption thing and as like a motivation like reminder of like oh you can fight through anything they had it they had somebody take it and form it into a lombardi trophy so it's now sitting in his house in the shape of a lombardi trophy on their mantle which is pretty cool uh alex smith played and uh went 22 of 32 for 162 yards two touchdowns two interceptions uh and then we get to the philadelphia passing game and oh boy Jalen Hurts, 7 of 20 for 72 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception. Nate Sudfeld, 5, Who? Exactly, five of 12 for 32 yards passing, uh, no touchdowns, one interception. Coach, t- the floor is yours. All right, so I watched and saw the, the second touchdown for them to go up 14 to uh, 10. And I, we, Aaron, we got a little distracted, and uh, I came back to seeing that they were down three. Down three with Jalen coming out on offense. Like, I, I literally walk to this point with Philly walking back onto the field to have play offense, and I don't see Jalen Hurts. And I immediately go, what the fuck happened? What happened? We were They were up. The Giants were in the playoffs. Now they're down three and Jalen Hurts isn't playing? My initial thought was, he got hurt. Like, oh my God, jump on Twitter. Look to the, the trends, see nothing. Then finally see, you know, Chris Collinsworth mentions that they benched him. And I go, what? Why? You're down three. He's 7 to 20 for 72 yards. All right, that's not great, but like, that's, I mean, he's still moving the ball. You know, he had, what, 60-some-odd rushing yards or something like that? Uh, Yeah, uh, eight carries for 34, 34. Uh, yards. So he had, like, I think 30 and yards. And two touchdowns. Yeah, two touchdowns. So, and I'm sitting here, and I'm like, all right, what's going on? And then it slowly starts to hit me. And this was like a process of, like, delayed uh, delayed release. Like, it was like a, uh, I had taken, like, a sleeping pill that was like an eight-hour release. I slowly started, like, they're throwing the game and you know aaron comes downstairs she's like, what's going on and i'm like washington's throwing this game like philly's throwing the game what do you mean they bench jalen hurts sudfeld's playing quarterback what what are they doing and then you know the game ends and i i stayed up because i i was a sucker and was like well maybe the sudfeld guy will all of a sudden pull some sort of magic like maybe maybe it will be something special happens here. No, you know, fifty six seconds left. They're they're running the the two minute drill, and I mean he throws some just <laughs> bad passes, and the clock just runs out with a uh, completed pass for a first down that they get tackled in bounds, and I just kind of sat on the arm of my couch, and I'm like Philly threw this game, Philly threw it. They legitimately said, here's the division. Now. Here's the problem that I have with this, and this is where I'm kind of going to to go on the rant here. The NFL is based on integrity. It's a league of, yes. it's a league of you know, guys who go out there and bash each other for four quarters of a game yep. and, f- and earn the right for a victory. 
for like seven months for for just and they and it's hard nose and it, and it's not you know like and I don't want to shit on the NBA but it's not the off season hey let's go work out together let's buddy buddy like there is legitimate conflict oh yeah and it, and it's glamorous for all of a cup of tea because unless you're a fan of one of these teams that is fortunate enough to win a Super Bowl mm. you know the Kansas Cities the New Englands the the New or uh, the Green Bays you know the insert team you know, the Giants, the Cowboys, unless you're a fan of one of these teams, most of the country isn't going to remember some of these guys' performances. So, it, like I said, it's sexy for all of a cup of tea. You know, by and large, I'm going to remember Malcolm Butler for the rest of my life because of that play at the end of the Super Bowl against the Seahawks. Rest of the country, probably. There's other guys in that game, I don't remember who the fuck they are. Right, and, and the thing is, is like... This is a game of respect and and your elders and the guys who came before you that busted their tail for them to get here. So there's integrity. There's a respect and adoration for the game. There is a there is a desire to want to win. Like, you know, the 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 JJ Watt speech comes to mind That's what I was really just bring up. comes really really into play in this because this is a guy whose team was down and out and he comes on that stage and is like we have let you down as fans. So there's that connection, too, from a, a team to a fan standpoint of, you know, even the Jets for as bad as they were, you know, the Jets players, if you're cheering for us to lose, you know, you're not a fan. Like, those are the players, you know? Even among teammates, because I saw a, a post on Facebook from the NFL where it was on the field after the Houston Texans game, and you saying, J.J. Yeah. reminded me, where Deshaun Watson was walking off the field mm-hmm. with J.J. Watt after yep. the game was over, and Deshaun goes, Dude, I'm sorry. We wasted one of your years. He goes, I'm I'm sorry. We should have been an eleven year eleven, 11 win, win team, team and we're five. So so that's that's where my, my gut reaction is. I'm not like, you know, we were on Facebook. I'm not mad at Philly, right? I'm not mad at them because the Giants should have won the division three weeks ago and had really bad performances down the stretch. That's on the Giants. And mm-hmm. the Giants know that. My problem with Philly is that you took a game of integrity and you said, you know what? To hell with you. We're just going to dive right now and and lay down and finger poke a doom, you know, a little wrestling reference, yep. and we're going to lay this down. Because you could have, Doug Peterson, and you are to blame for this, gone in and, and played Jalen Hurts in the fourth and just let it ride. And instead you pulled your horses and you said, you know what? Alex Smith, here's the division, here's your story, here's your crowning moment. Because that's what this is. I'm fully on the – They the, he was the Kansas City offense coordinator. Yeah. He had a great relationship with Alex Smith. That's what I think boiled down to this. I mean, I know that might be a controversial take. We'll just use the allegedly, allegedly. Sure, allegedly. But I think that's what this boiled down to. I don't think it was anything Doug Peterson had against the Giants. I think it's just he saw somebody that he had good rapport with and he wanted to say, here you go. And that, to me, is fucking egregious. And that's the thing that makes me infuriated. And for the Philly fans that justify this in any shape, way, or form, good for you. I hope you love your three ride, you know, your three three pick position that you got from going from nine to six, and you land somebody great, and and they're successful because your division or your 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 team right now looks like shit. Looks terrible. Your players are pissed. Your your ownership is pissed, and you, you, your star quarterback, who now was given the keys to this team, is pissed. And the guy who replaced him was going to be the next guy that you all were in love with is pissed. So you have literally and and the thing that really boggled my mind about this game was Carson Wentz was dressed and mm-hmm. and. and on the sidelines, not not in pads, but was you know there in attendance, and wasn't going to play. So you've burned that bridge. Yep. There ain't no repairing that relationship. No, he's gone. So you got your general, you got your defensive coordinator leaving, and and the defense played their fucking tails off, and that sucks because they busted their balls to try and fight for that game for Sudfeld to come out and play quarterback. Good for you, Philly. I hope you're happy. I I the Philly fans that tried to justify this. Good, good on you. I feel bad for whoever Philly ends up taking with that pick 
you know, whoever it ends up being, because there's going to be a lot of attention put on them for nothing that is there through their fault. You know, there's, there's going to be a lot of attention because inevitably whoever that person ends up being, offense, defense, special team, whatever it is, you know, there's going to be a lot of attention put on them because of how they got this pick. And I, and I feel really bad for them because there's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of cameras and a lot of mics in their face for something they didn't do. Now to the game, I was not watching the game, even though I picked, I picked it as my leap. You know, I didn't really care about the game, the teams. And I figured anything happens, I'll hear about it, you know, and whatever. So I was playing cyberpunk on uh, that night and I happened to hit a loading screen and I was like, oh, let's check Twitter. And I saw Pat McAfee tweet, wait, why is Jalen Hurts not in the game or something to that effect? And, and I'm like, coach, I went, what the fuck? So I pulled up, you know, the broadcast on my phone, you know, through my cable provider. And I was like, huh, this is really fucking weird. Like, what the fuck is going on? And, and then slowly, you know, the night progressed. I don't put this on the Philly players because it's, it's kind of like a movie where it's a terrible movie. You can't really put it on the actor or actress because they, they can only do what they're given. They, they can only work with what they got. There's only so much they can do. The players can only do what they're told. There's mm-hmm. only there's only so much they can do. So I, I don't blame the players in any way, shape, or form for what happened. I 100% put this on Doug Peterson because, I'm sorry, whatever fucking reason you're giving for doing this, it's bullshit, it's a lie, and you know it's a lie. What, you're fucking doing it to evaluate Nud, Nate Sudfeld, you know, who was a drafted in 2016 out of Indiana? No disrespect to Indiana, but he's the fucking 187th pick out of the sixth round. What a terrible take that was, too, for the fans that were, like, saying that. Mm. What, like, no, you're, you're not. You're really evaluating a guy who was taken 187th in the sixth fucking round and- over a guy you just drafted who's your rookie who was in the 53rd pick of the second round. You really think 187 is better than 53? And Fuck out of here. played one snap last year. <laughs> it, it's utter bullshit. You know, I, I've read some reports online that there were a couple defensive players in the locker room had to be held back after going at, from going after Doug Peterson. Good. <laughs> I, I think I read one place Zach Ertz was less than thrilled with the guy and, and got in his face. It's egregious. It's bullshit. At least when teams tank, and tanking in the NFL is not a thing. Christ, there's a website called tankathon.com where you can track, you know, draft orders and everything, and it updates weekly. Mm. Tank, uh, tanking in the NFL is a thing. At least in in this instance, it's a lot. Other than this instance, it's a lot more subtle, and you don't really pick up on it. Hello, New York Football Jets. You know, so to do this, it's utter bullshit. And and you know, I hope it was worth the team. To move, like Coach, I hope it was worth the team to move up three positions. And I'm going to borrow a quote from Don LaGreca on the uh, Michael K show yesterday. I hope you draft Lynn fucking Swan with this pick. Because if you don't, it's going to be egg on your face for the rest of your careers. This is one of the most ugliest looks on a team and a coaching organization that I've seen in recent memory. So your, your fan base already has a bad look because, well, ice balls, booing Santa Claus. Oh, and, Philly is. It's Philly's Philly. That's all. And, you, and just all the other. So, so your city and, and any team that already goes in there, already you're, you already have a bad look. This sure as shit don't help it. Philly is Philly, so obviously their fan base is their fan base. You, and, and you have their reputation. But this game, let us just kind of rewind a little bit. This was purposely flexed. By the NFL. Oh, God, that's what I was just going to talk about next. Yeah. So this was scheduled to be the game of the week. You have a national audience. Sunday Night Football is the biggest program on all television. Mind you, it was flexed after Philly lost to the Cowboys Uh and were out of the division. Right. And they left the Giants-Cowboys game, which, win or lose, that team could be in position to be the team to win the division. Correct. Correct. They flex that to Sunday Night Football, which I said is the most watched television program in all of network television, cable. The right. ratings for it are huge. So all eyes are on you. Especially when it is a game of magnitude. Uh-huh. And the stakes were never higher for the NFC East and the division because we're still talking playoffs. There was one spot to be left filled. We had the Giants in Dallas, which had all the dr- the drama you could want from a game, and all stakes were on Philly, who had nothing to play for. I get it. But you're still there as an integrity to play the game. As J.J. Watt put last week in that post-game speech he gave in that locker room, 
you get to, I'm going to paraphrase, you get to play the game for the fans, for your team, for your city. You show out there, no matter what your score or record is, and you play. You play to you can't play no more. You give 100%. This is the expectation, being a member of the National Football League. The fact that it was a close competitive game and you decide to pull your starters for whatever reason in that third quarter is insulting. And there's no other way to spin it. You can't sit there and tell me to my face that this was a move, well, you know, we're worried about our draft pick. No, if you're worried about your draft pick, you don't play them at all, period. Exactly. That, and Ken, that is what made me the angriest about this game. Mm-hmm. You could have, if you legitimately, you know, for the people that were saying, well, we didn't want Jalen Hurts to get go out there and, and try to win this game himself and get hurt. Okay. Then don't play him at all. Exactly. Don't go into this game with him dressed. That's plain and simple. Uh huh. That's and, the whole thing. And if you are that concerned, then you send him at halftime. But this is, you know, I, I had a, one of our Giants buddies that really had a good post and it made a ton of sense. This is a rookie quarterback. This yeah. is game experience that he's getting right now. And you you can't trade that in practice. So you pull him to start a fourth quarter in a game where he really hasn't played in any competitive type NFL games where he needs to, to manage the clock and do all those things that you can't get in a practice. And now you rob that from him. Exactly. So, I mean, coming from Bama where he played cupcakes. Well, you know what? This must be something with Alabama quarterbacks. Because you know my usual take I have about Tua. And this, sure. And this well, got exposed. With, I'm I, mean, not, no, yeah. I know it's, and it always apples and oranges, but let right. me finish about this. All right. You have a quarterback or two rookie quarterbacks on both teams that need those valuable reps in the NFL because it's a step up in competition and play level that they did not get. Tua got exposed because, unfortunately, Fitzpatrick couldn't close for him. And look what happened to him in Buffalo. <laughs> Nuff said there. <laughs> That no closer was going to come in and save that game. Well, still, they don't have that option, and you saw how badly he played and how people are already writing him off at the end of the game, which is sure. so unfair to him, it's not even funny. So we flipped the coin now to Hertz, who has been the debate between Philly fans about who am I riding with this week? Would you guys flip-flop more than a mattress? It's either Wentz or Hertz each single week. So now Hertz is the guy. Let's go. Let's run with him. And then to have your organization pull him. Now, whether it's your GM telling Peterson to do it, whether it's Peterson himself, either way, the fact that you pull your guys off the field and basically say, we're waving the white flag for a draft pick, wrong place, wrong time, wrong look. There wrong is city. nothing redeeming about you this. You don't, like, Philly is hard nosed. Yeah. Like, you don't do that in Philly, you know? Exactly. Because if there like, were fans in the stadium, trust me, they probably would have pelted. Oh, my God. Think about how bad it was when the Sixers were obviously diving for, for losses. For trust the process. For, yeah, while they were rebuilding. And yeah. how pissed Philly fans were. Yeah, it's what ins- do you think if their team deliberately did their into their faces? Like I said, there was snow on the ground. They would have been, pel- been pelting everybody. And, you know, the fan, like they would have paid their hard-earned money. They would have earned the rights to go to those games. And they would have had every right to act the way that they would have acted. It was really telling how bad this was when Chris Mortensen uh, for ESPN tweeted on Sunday. Now, Chris Mortensen, if in case you don't know, he's been covering the NFL for various organizations since the 80s. Mm-hmm. He's been around a while. He tweeted out on Sunday, quote, This is the most negative barrage of comments I have received about a game's lack of integrity, and that's not even counting Giants-related bias. Consensus from those in the in NFL and who have been associated with it, disgrace. That's not the fault of the Washington football team. Close quote. Duh, I no. mean, the broadcast was talking about. You have Chris Collinsworth saying, "I could have never have done something like this." Exactly. That, you have literally. So I guarantee you, like Goodell was probably watching this game and was like, oh, whatever yeah. stress ball or something he had to squeeze or break, he was probably clinching it with all of his might because he was probably. The fact that the NBC broadcasters were like, "Oh yeah, they're they're throwing this game. I never would have been able to do this." Must have had him pissed. And Collinsworth knew he was going to get a phone call because I don't know whether he said it on the game or an interview the next day. I read an article where he he knew he was going to get a phone call because of some of the stuff they said. He's like, "Yeah, I know I'm getting some phone calls from New York right now because they're pissed about what we said." Good for him though, because that is what you need to say. Like, right. listen, I understand about towing a company in the line. But still, this is not the time to tow the company line and try saying it's all smoke and mirrors. Okay, if you are paying attention and watching what's happening and you have Jalen Hurts on the sideline who got caught on videotape going, this ain't right. That was that was insane. That's the most <laughs> telling thing 
you can say about this game when the players themselves are saying that and we live in that digital age where everybody's got a camera phone everybody's got video all over the place if you are in a public place guess what people can record you people tape you it is what it is especially at a sport game so the fact that got caught and that got blown up that is all you need to say about this is how awful and egregious and just a slap in the face of anything that you had for integrity for a game. I know you want to say the two arguments I've heard from people about this. Well, the Giants should have won one more game, and did you see what happened in Cleveland? Yeah, and here's what I also say about that. Yeah, should the Giants have won a game? Sure. But is your whole division hot garbage? Yep. Right, and that's why I'm not... I'm not holding sour grapes about the Giants not winning the division because they didn't deserve it. <laughs> you're yeah, six and ten. It. Yeah, you're six and ten. Like you don't you don't deserve it. You know, they should have beat Philly the first time. You know, they should have had a better performance against San Francisco, and I think that was like week three or four. Mm-hmm. And um, the Chicago game where they lost by four, where they were driving and Daniel Jones threw a uh, or the the Rams game when they were down. Um, I think like five or something weird. And Daniel Jones is driving down the field and throws a uh, force pass to Golden Tate that gets intercepted, but they could have won that game. Like these are all things that I went back to when I was like trying to to you know process things. Yeah. I was running back to being like, all right, yeah, no, the Giants didn't earn this division and didn't deserve to win it. But what Philly, did, what the problem is with what the the Eagles organization did and what the coaching staff did was took a game that is of. You know, and I know we keep saying it. And if you're playing the drinking game, I'm gonna say it again: integrity, integrity, integrity. And took that and said, "No, go fuck yourself. We're going to take a dive. We're gonna throw this game. We're gonna put in Nate Sudfeld, who has no business playing in an NFL game. We're not gonna address Carson Wentz. We're not gonna address Deshaun Watson. We're not or Jackson. We're not gonna address Fletcher Cox. We're not gonna address uh, Carson Wentz." We're not gonna dra- uh, we're not gonna address Alshon Jeffries, and you do all these uh, uh, Runyon, you know, and you do all these specific moves that show that uh, Miles Sanders is another guy who was pissed in the locker room who didn't dress, mm-hmm. and you do all these deliberate moves that show that you are willing to to. Th- I mean, we went into the game with that as the injury report, saying, "All right, this is going to be an uphill battle for Philly to fight to begin with." Yeah, but. To be down three going into the fourth quarter with Jalen Hurts playing good, not great, and to bench him, that was the move that broke that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the this is they're doing this. It's it's a game of integrity, it's also a game of respect. We all remember what happened last year between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, between mm-hmm. Miles Garrett and Mason Rudolph. What happened on Sunday after the game was over? They cleared the air. They had a handshake moment and everything's good between them. There is no respect or integrity in in the Philly front office or the coaching staff. There's no honor about this. There is nobody on that football team that respects that head coaching staff around. They have lost the respect of that entire team. They have lost the respect of the entire NFL. There is not a I cannot fathom an owner, coach, GM, janitor in the NFL that is okay with what Philly did and goes, No, I get it. Totally fine move. There is nobody who respects it. And in bringing anybody in Good fucking luck. Are you really going to want to go play for Philly when they may sit your ass so they can bump, jump up three places in the draft? What they're going to have to do is... Deal. they got to get rid of Peterson. Well, they have to deal... Yeah, I agree. They have to go blow up their front office. They're going to have to get rid of their GM. Well, they already fired him. Oh, Roseman's gone? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He, so they got to get a new GM. you got to get a new head coach because Peterson has lost that locker room. Yep. It's well, no, they, they, yeah. He's lost the locker room and nobody's going to trust him. Well, right. No, that's the whole thing. Where he goes from here, that's a, that's a whole other different ball game. Like he'll go back to be an offensive coordinator somewhere. Yeah, but he is not going to be running a football team anytime soon. Even though he has that Super Bowl win to him, the fact that this damage has been done and this is the cherry on the Sunday this of their season. This could have been the one o'clock game. Yeah, yeah. and every, done the same things. And it probably wouldn't have been as bad. Right, no, but the but microscope the fact, is right on right, them for the, Sunday night. The fact that it was on NBC, NBC and the NFL opted to flex this game in the national TV. So you are being put in a position, a primetime network, where the NFL is showcasing your organization and you f- slap them in the face. That The NFL will not forget that. No, and I and I think if Doug Peterson does get fired, this won't be a case of where he quickly lands on his feet and maybe some other collegiate coaching job or, or a coordinator position. No major organization, pro or college, is going to touch this. Guy. No, the, see, this is the thing with the NFL, and somebody pointed this out. 
the amount of guys that get regurgitated and, and chewed up and spit out and, and brought back in because they're friends of friends or so and so, I guarantee you he'd probably end up some position in Kansas City, especially if uh, you know their offensive coordinator does get the Jets job or, or interviews somewhere and lands somewhere. Yeah, Benjamin's interviewing for yeah, them. you know. He's gonna land on his feet. Peterson, will and land. we're just purely speculative because he's not fired yet. Oh, yeah. There's no inkling that he is, but there's a lot of allegedly going on. But we're just playing devil's advocate here. And and Pat, let me just kind of touch upon this and bring it to baseball too. Sure. Look how many people from the Astros Oof. got rehired yeah. after being yeah. being yeah. part of one of the most you know Dude. insulting yeah networking friends of friends man. You yeah. Always they that uh, somebody pointed this out the other day in the NFL because they were talking about how uh, you know Gase. You know, how could he land a head coaching job, or how could he land another offensive coordinator job? And he was already associated with, like, three potential landing spots. Yeah. So, you know, Jason the, Garrett, you know, like. The NFL recycles all their coaches. Yeah, yeah it's I mean, it, it is what it is. It's very tough to to break in and debut as a coach somewhere. Yeah. But once you get in that system, you're going to get passed around. So if Peterson does leave Philly, which I think they have to at this point. Oh, because has to. The negative press about this is telling free agents, one, do you want to go there? And be a part of right. this culture. Like you think, like a guy. So JJ Watt, obviously potential free agent. You think he's gonna want to go? Oh no, to oh, Philly fuck that. after something like that? No, fuck that. And I think a lot of players are gonna feel the same way. Well, and so. here's the even crazier thing: Philly has no cap space. Right. Even if they get rid of Carson Wentz, they're still thirty five million over the cap. Yeah, they're screwed either <laughs> way. That team is so unfortunately they are be... literally backed into a corner, and damn they did it to themselves. Damn yeah. oh, they yeah. did it to themselves. I have. Zero remorse. I literally now, from now on, will cheer for any team playing Philly. Yeah. Any team, any team. I think you can guarantee NBC won't flex them into Sunday night. Oh, games. they're not going to flex them. They're going to be lucky if they get a primetime game anytime down the road. It's sad to say, but these actions about the alleged tank job, and I'm just saying, this is how we call it as we see it. This is our opinions and, on it. But you can't say the evidence is not there. And let me say, you know, if anybody wants to bring up, like, I never t- said for the Giants to lose. I said if they can land Trevor Lawrence, you have to because he's a generational talent. And when the Jets won that game against the Rams, all right, not the smartest of moves, but you won a game, you know? When the Knicks win that one extra game that bumps them from the fourth spot to the eighth spot, do I get mad? Sure, I do. But at the time when they win, I'm like, hey, let's go. The Knicks got to win. You know, I don't, it doesn't hit me until the draft lottery comes. Sure. And they go from, you know, and ESPN has to hammer home, well, the Knicks, you know, won that extra game. So instead of being the fourth draft lottery position, now they're in the eighth and they have a 0.1% chance. Yeah. That's when it hits me and I'm like, damn it. Why'd they have to win that last game of the season? But that's just, that, you can't help that. But this no. is terrible. This is a bad look no matter how you want to break it down. And for Philly, you're going to have a lot of answers to do about this. And and to the Philly fans that, you know, have their opinions, roles reversed and the Giants did this to you or the Cowboys did this to you. You'd be screaming bloody you'd murder. You'd be throwing a temper tantrum. Because I'm, a, I'm telling you right now, newsflash, I'm a Giants fan. I'm not mad at Philly for what they did. I'm pissed at the Giants for what they've done. But I'm more mad that the sport that I do love has now a, a, a you know a tarnish of the actual game level. Like, yeah, players do bad shit. I'm separate. There is the no two. sainthood, right? The, sep- but you have to separate the two, right? Yeah. The the shit that the players do on their own time is what they do, and it leaves black eyes over the sport all the time. But the sport in and of itself is pure, mm-hmm. you know. And now it's a work. It's, it's com- no different than Vince McMahon booking Roman Reigns to go over ex-wrestler. That is why the situation is as dire as it looks. And this is the optics that we see on a nationally televised game, which had p- big playoff implications. And like I say, the two arguments against should the Giants have won a game? Yeah, sure. But this is a situation they are in. So guess what? You go out there, you play the game. You don't go and rest everybody mid game. I don't understand the other argument was well Cleveland did, you know, Pittsburgh did that with Cleveland. Cleveland or Pittsburgh was sitting starters anyway. And another thing too, do you think Pittsburgh They go was, in they went into the game sitting them though. Yes. Is the difference. Exactly. They went in sitting and honestly, do you think they were scared about playing Cleveland again? 
Had this been a different team, whole different ball of wax. Well, and I know somebody's going to say, well, Buffalo did it. Yeah, Buffalo did it, but they were also up three fucking scores. Exactly. They and, they were up. And they were thrashing Miami. They made Matt Barkley look like a goddamn diamond. Exactly. Matt Barkley looked like Matt Flynn. Nuff said there if you can figure that reference out. And I could save a rant for another time about how Miami played out. But no, this is where the season has now ended on such a bad note. For the integrity purposes. Yeah. For Philly, you're off season. You have to get rid of Doug Peterson, in my opinion. Yep. You've already got rid of your GM. You need to clean house. Unfortunately, you're screwed up for your cap space. It's going to take you a while to dig out. I hope you can sit there and you find a diamond in the rough for the draft picks that you now have acquired by losing that game. But it's got not going to be enough to save your season. You're already screwed in the cap space. Have fun being in the bottom of the division for the next couple of years because that's where you're going to be, unfortunately. Yep. It's sad for the players that are actually trying to play their hearts out and we're actually screaming about the game and wanting to win. Yeah. But that was taken away from you. Yeah. For Washington, good luck with Tom Brady first round. And Chase Young, I understand you want to care about your team, but calling out the GOAT is not the best idea to do for your first game out. I, I, I appreciate the <laughs> swag, but man. Listen, Washington, newsflash, and not very good. <laughs> no, no. And thank, like, <laughs> and thank you for giving Tom Brady, Antonio Brown, dude. I mean, board material. it wasn't even. It's not the the <laughs> simple point is, yeah, not very good. No, and yeah. Tampa Bay yeah. is clicking right now. Right. So you are going into this game, and yeah, all right, Washington. Has your defense been playing pretty good? Yeah. Is your offense garbage? Sure is. And I'm sorry, but Alex Smith right now is not looking the same as he was three weeks prior to this calf injury when he was mobile and able to run because there was definitely throws where he would have been able to get outside the pocket um, and Philly's defenders were chasing him down because he just his right calf is not responding very well right now. Right. And it's obvious. And Tampa Bay, Jason Pierre-Paul, and that front four – are going to see that and feast. They're going to have a field oh, day. Yeah. Well, playoffs are here, so I figured it would be quick, fun to look back, because I did save our predictions from the start of the year. Look back and see how we did. Uh, for the AFC East, we all chose Buffalo, so kudos pew, to pew, pew. Kudos to us. Yeah. Uh, for the AFC North, we all said Baltimore, so whoops. All right, well, you Pittsburgh, know. Pittsburgh won the AFC North. Uh, for the AFC South, it was uh, Tennessee, uh, which, uh, Coach, you got to give you credit, you did pick Tennessee to win that division. Shaboing! Ken and I both had Houston, so uh, yep. whoops. whoops. Uh, the <laughs> AFC West went to Kansas City, which we all chose, so kudos to us. Hey, good job for picking that one. Yeah. That was tough, guys. It was a reach. That oh, was yeah. a real, uh, real yeah. stretch. Uh, and then for the three wildcard positions, uh, they went to Baltimore, Cleveland, and then the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, Ken had New England, Pittsburgh, and Indianapolis. So two out of three. One and one, yeah, two out of three. I guess not uh, bad. Pittsburgh not bad. made it in. Uh, Coach had New England, Pittsburgh, and Houston. So one out of the three. All right. Uh, and then I chose uh, New England, Tennessee, and Pittsburgh. So technically two out of three. I hey, guess. New England, fuck you for making us all wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, we thought things would go better than they actually did. Uh, and then flipping over to the NFC East. Uh, whoops, wrong tab. Uh, I, we all chose Dallas to win the NFC East. So, whoops. Yes. Thanks, thanks Mike, Mike McCarthy. Yeah. Yeah. Whoops, you. whoops on that one. Uh, for the NFC North, we all chose Green Bay, so kudos to us on that one. Hey. Also a reach. Yeah. Uh, Tough pick. For the NFC South, uh, the division went to the New Orleans Saints, uh, which I did pick the New Orleans Saints. Hey, good for you. The New Orleans Saints, uh, Coach and Ken both took Tampa Bay. So all right. Whoops. Hey, yeah. we had them in the playoffs. We had them in the playoffs. Uh, and then for the NFC West, uh, we all chose the Seattle Seahawks, so kudos to us. Uh, and then for the uh, wild card positions, they went to Chicago, Tampa Bay, and there it is, uh, third one, uh, the L.A. Rams. Uh, for where the heck is it? There it is. Uh, coach chose Philly. Uh, Fuck. Whoops. New Orleans. Whoops. And then Atla in Atlanta. Yeah, you took Atlanta. Again. I took Atlanta. <laughs> I thought they were going to be better than they were. Yeah. I thought they were going to bounce back. Yeah. What and, can you say? Uh, I took Philly. Whoops. Oh, yeah. Tampa Bay and San Francisco. And then Ken took San Francisco, New Orleans, and Philly. Damn, we all took Philly. Fuck. Yeah. We are so dumb. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we got to remember, we all took Dallas figuring Dak would be there the entire year. Yeah, that's sure, Dallas, sure. I mean, hey, injury. hey, hey. They Dallas has Dak, and they're in the playoffs. It's a whole different ball It's game. a whole other ball game. Uh-huh. Because they're not going 6-10 and 10 with Dak in the lineup. It, it definitely that not. Atlanta, that Atlanta choice, though. Yeah. yeah. Dude, I just, <laughs> I really thought, like, I... Every year, like, I just think that they're going to have a bounce-back year. And, I mean, on paper, they looked really good. How did I know that they still, they still weren't going to be over the Super Bowl? Who is Atlanta? Like, what is Atlanta? 
I mean, literally, how? How? Well, it's something That's we're gonna, or What is Atlanta? Chicken and strip clubs. Yes. We'll definitely have to see what happens in the upcoming weekend. And I think for the two-minute drill, we'll just kind of wrap up talking about locks and leaps. And we have to give kudos to Rich from 3FN. He won the 607 bracket of locks and leaps. Yeah, uh, fake news. Uh, this this is not true. Stop the count. Stop, Stop the, count. the count. Stop the count. Uh, this is fake news. Uh, Ken, Revote. Ken, you are an AFC East uh, uh, fan, so you, sh- you should want the AFC East to win it. Uh, this is this is total fake news. Revote. Uh, you, can't you just can't you just call you know find find more points? Find know? find the game. Find find more points and, and just declare me the winner. Didn't Ken? The pad didn't pad pick a game where maybe they covered but they didn't actually win. Uh, I, I mean, I, pick the find the points. I, I think that's cool. I'm not. At, I'm not asking for much. I'm cl- I'm just asking for you know, thirty three points, which is just one more than I actually finished with. Exactly. Can't you? Can't you? No. In all seriousness, kudos to Rich. You know, heavy, I'm not. No, not for me. Heavy, heavy is on the, you, Rich. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. Uh, I, my dynasty is still intact. I'm following the Patriots method from their first Super Bowl runs. Win the first two, lose the th- lose the third year, come back the fourth uh, fourth year. It was definitely a fun competition. I know. Uh, so, I mean, kudos to Rich about that. Coach is definitely looking forward to next season already. He's getting that marked down. And for the content creator pool, yours truly took home the case. Rigged. So, oh, yeah. All yeah. that bullshit. Yeah, exactly. You were going back Rigged. in and changing. I saw you changing shit. <laughs> I, you must have been using a Dominion system to uh, elect your uh, teams, huh? Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Oh, my God. Man, there's some anger coming out of the panel this All week. All lies. All lies indeed. But hey, it was a fun season to so do. Weird so weird that you won all the tiebreaker things with the most scored points and uh and most uh non points. Listen, it's not my mm. fault I chose Kansas City for most and the Jets for least every week. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> usually bet on that it works. Fruit. Okay, usually you do Hey, that I way. actually I think I picked Buffalo for week seventeen. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no, week seventeen I actually had a strong also, one. Fuck in the you afternoon. Buffalo should have gone for sixty. Yeah, Aaron, it was a long day in the household with that because she she got really upset, oh. and I felt terrible. Well, I didn't. She so. was she was. I you know <laughs> I don't blame you. She was like, I'm representing all of women, and I go, you're really not. And she goes, Am I the only girl in this? And I go, Well, yeah. And she goes, Then I'm representing all of women. Well, we did it. We did throw out some advice to some other female. Content I'm just creators teasing. Too. She really. She. I mean, she was a little pissed, but I mean, it was all right. Well, we just got to keep growing on it for next Fuck, year. She it, held it down. Man. It was. It was a fun season, though. We yeah. have to admit, this yeah. was definitely fun going back. She got and forth. 13 games right. Yeah. last week, man. 13 I games. I know. That's nuts. She's scary about this. Like, I, I'm actually like, you got to take her down to the local casino and, and run a parlor. Dude, I was pissed that we didn't do anything with that 13 week game. Ooh. I mean, fuck. Could you imagine doing a 13 team parlay and getting them all right? Ooh. Uh, the closest I've ever seen cha-ching, cha-ching. is uh, out in Vegas. I saw twelve. Oh. Well, she had the one the first week. She had twelve right, so she upped the best total in week sixteen. So. Yeah, no, Aaron is a beast about it. So, it's like I say, when she comes back next season, I think we all are going to be looking. Probably going to end up getting in fantasy next. She's going to be <laughs> begging to play more football stuff. All right, it possibly could happen, but it was a great season, though. Uh, thank you to everybody who participated in both pools. The brackets were fun. It's definitely always a great time talking locks and leaps, but let's talk about it one last time for the season. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. Week 17 is in the books. What is your thoughts? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Ted Bundy murdered my dad's friend's sister in 1974 while on his reign of terror in Utah. At least, Bundy admitted to killing her just before his execution, but police were never able to locate her body. That's the topic of just one episode on Straight Up Enigmas, a podcast to explore the unexplained. We discuss the mysterious deaths of the Jameson family, share terrifying true stories from real people about sleep paralysis, and explore Cleopatra's missing tomb. I'm Jaden McKell, and I'm the host of Straight Up Enigmas. Our bite-sized, bi-weekly episodes focus on the world's strangest mysteries, sacred and sonic geometry, the murder of Karen Silkwood, Turkmenistan's door to hell, the curse of the omen, and much more. Listen and subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you find podcasts. This is Rich, the host of the Three Fat Nerds podcast and co-host of the Horror Zone 607 podcast, and you are listening to our hashtag 607 podcast brothers, the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. Now kick it back over to Ken Moneybags and the crew.
Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. And time to run the ropes and talk some wrestling. Wrestling! Now, AEW and NXT both have big shows this week. But first, we have to give props where props is due. Apps a goddamn lootly. Apps a tootaloo-ly. Last week was the Brody Lee tribute show on AEW Dynamite. Uh-huh. And obviously, is a very tragic loss in wrestling. We have talked about it at great lengths on 607 Podcasts. Uh, TWS, we've talked about it here as well. Uh, losing Brody Lee was a tremendous loss to everybody who knew him. He's such a great man. AEW ran a tribute show in his honor, and his son, Negative One, as he was nicknamed, yep. uh, picked the card and the wrestlers for the matches. From top to bottom, this show was excellent and such a, an emotional tribute Kudos to everybody involved with AEW for this one. Yeah. This just hit you very close to home. I mean, especially how they ended it, where they gave the TNT title to his son and said, we're going to make a new design. This one is yours forever. And they had the video tribute as well. It was just a phenomenal night where wrestling became more than wrestling. Yeah. And just really became like an emotional just so many feels were going on with this. It was it, just it was powerful. I mean, from some of the, the wrestler, you know, Cole Cabana, uh, you know, obviously a lot of the Dark Order guys, yeah, um, yeah. you know, really were wearing it heavy. Um, then to the end of the show with what uh, Tony Khan and uh, Cody and uh, number 10 were in the ring, you know, for the final uh, tribute, the tribute video, you know, magical, um, naming uh, Brody Jr., the uh, forever TNT championship effectively retiring the belt, you know, absolutely tremendous. Um, it was, it was honestly, you know, it was a magical night. It was the, I think the way that a wrestling tribute show, show should go. 1000%. Yeah. You know, oh, because yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest thing, I mean, oftentimes with these tribute shows, you know, it's difficult for the wrestlers to perform, but yeah. these guys knew, you know, what would have been truly wanted, you know, from Brody. And yeah. that was putting on a hell of a night, and that's exactly what they gave. Yeah, you could definitely tell from the outset it was going to be a very emotional night. I mean, they they all started the entire roster on the main stage there with, you know, his wife and kids right there front and center. The one that caught my eye was the former WWE guys in the You know, Miro, formerly known as Rusev in WWE, was in tears, mm-hmm. just full, full tilt bawling. You know, Dax, you know, FTR, you know, Revival, borderline tears just and, and i like what jared chris jericho said during the first match he goes listen it's going to be an emotional night if you have to let it out let it out yeah he, like he uh, that's one of the awesome things i like with jericho was yeah he's a heel yeah he's a bad guy yeah he's supposed to be a bit of a dick is is, is his character right now but he dropped that persona for long enough just go hey listen if you need to cry it's okay the the moments the the things that caught obviously eric redbeard yeah. Coming out was yeah. that was absolutely tremendous because the, the I sign mean, he held long time tag team partner long time tag team partner I mean that that moment hit me the hardest uh, and then uh, silver yeah, yeah John silver yeah. John silver yeah. obviously wearing the costume that Brody had bought for him yeah. to uh, match the being the elite story that they had on the YouTube page uh, then to hit you know Brody's finisher and everything that was absolutely gut wrenching. Um, and then you know MJF, you know, yeah. Oh my God! What can, what can you say other than my God? Does he wear being a piece of shit better than probably anybody else in the He's world? He's the best heel in the game right Cause, now. Because I mean, the, the what he was saying to Brody Jr. and everything, I was like, eek. Well, but, and, I mean, and, and I know people were kind of giving MJF some shit from that, but to them, I would say, did you not see the look on the kid's face when he, he lo- hit yeah, he when loved he, it. when he hit yeah. him with the kendo stick? The kid was in on it. and yeah. He loved it. He loved, yeah. I mean, to to see him get to whack him with the kendo stick and stuff, I was like, this is great. Yeah. Um, and and everything like it was just it was so well done. It was and, it was so well done. Yeah. And the other thing I liked was a bunch of the wrestlers in Florida had a, a New Year's Eve you know get together. Oh and, my god, and, that and video. Britt Baker, you know, spoiler alert, kayfabe alert. Is dating, yeah. she's dating Adam Cole? Uh, they were there, and you know, Cole, this was the first time he'd seen Brody Lee Jr. So, it, it, Brody Lee Jr. was there's another video I forget who posted, somebody posted it on one of the wrestlers posted it on Instagram where he's just going after a, a couple of wrestlers and just attacking him, and they're selling <laughs> the hell out of everything. Yeah. Well, then Adam Cole got there, and was and he's hitting Adam Cole with all these moves, and Adam Cole's selling the hell out of everything, and he pins him for the three count. It was just awesome. Oh man, that video <laughs> I, I've watched at least 17 times, yeah, it's awesome. 
like I say, they could not have done a better job honoring a no. man. And to you, to the idiots that are like, oh, is Vince McMahon going to fire Adam Cole for doing this? No. Go eat shit. He's a yeah. father. He gets Like, it. I mean, stop being assholes and just enjoy the moment. The fact fuck. that WWE was promoting right. AEW's show. Like, like fuck. Well, yeah. and the fact that WWE allowed... Photos of Eric, uh-huh. of, of right. Brody and Eric Redbeard with them holding the SmackDown tag team belts to be used. Yeah. Now I get that there were you know any they they even had the one where it was all the guys on the on the overseas tour where they all made you know the Luke, yeah yeah the, yeah, the, yeah, 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 shirts. yeah shirts yeah you know I get that's a personal photo so WWE really doesn't have to give permission for that but there was the photo of of you know Brody and Eric Redbeard in their Bludgeon Brothers uniforms wearing holding up the SmackDown Live tag team belts they had to get permission to use that and for and and uh, the other people that are saying you know WWE for not doing they they gave AEW the right away yeah, yeah. which is what they should have done exactly like that and you know for the and then Triple H you know tweeted out about how you know NXT is running their show he has to yeah he has to do that like he cannot, you know, th- there's uh, sponsors and, and network ties that they have that they have to respect their contracts. They can't just ignore the fact that they're running yeah. a show. Yeah. They couldn't just say, all right, this is, you know, what we need to do. We need to not air NXT. Like, they had to air a program. Ex- but, they, you know, they, they, they gave AEW the right away because that's where Brody was. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they, and they yep. should have, and they did. And kudos for WWE for doing that because... History shows, let's face facts, they're not always the ones to do the right thing, and here they did. Yeah, yeah they did exactly the the right thing here and let AEW honor him, and they did a great job. Like I said, it was such an emotional night. A tragedy that happened, but honoring the great man that Brody was, it just was all the emotions. And then even to touch upon the Eddie Kingston post or sure. card, card speech that got leaked out, or pre-show speech, man, rather, it was just... Everything about it is just a, a great way to send off a falling friend. And yeah. The the thing too with that Eddie thing, obviously was on the independence for so long. Mm-hmm. You know, to come into the locker room, um, and I mean I was never much of an Eddie guy, but um after seeing that speech and just what what leadership yeah. for that dude to have. I mean, to step up and be the one to give the pre show speech like to that way, you know, like my God, I was like taken back. I was like, God damn, this is a leader. Like he should be a captain of a football team, not, yeah. not a locker room speech guy. Like that was nuts. You yeah. know, he should be a motivational speaker. Yeah, he was. It was just an absolutely perfect speech. And like I said, for a fitting tribute to somebody that has passed way too yeah. soon, yep. and just yeah. you know, just all the emotions just poured out. And yep. like I say, if you haven't seen the show, you should watch it. It's a phenomenal night. It is definitely emotional, but I mean, watch the being. Why? Well, I mean, I I went in full in watching the uh, being the elite. You know, Brody special. So I got some of the references that I probably wouldn't have gotten before. So when they came out with the paper and threw them at you know the inner circle. Yeah. You know, if you know if you don't if you don't watch the show, like you don't get that. So go back watch the the being the elite special for Brody, and then go back and watch the show, and you'll get the moments. Because the ropes, the, the paper stuff, I wouldn't have gotten. So to see Adam Page, you know, the cowboy, you know, load up the the double barrel and throw double papers at him, I was like, that is top shelf. Yeah. Like I said, it was just such a fitting tribute that we can't speak highly enough about right. it. Right. Yeah. And obviously, our condolences still go out. And yeah. It's still a tough situation. But AEW is coming back with their New Year's Smash card yep. this week. Yeah. Just changing gears here a little bit. And NXT has their New Year's Evil card. Oh, uh-huh. Sounds like a well. uh, competition. Yeah. Well, it's something <laughs> that they both were planning on doing. I know that, um, obviously, before Brody's passing, they were going to run the uh, first night of New Year's Smash uh, this past Wednesday, but now they pushed everything back one week. So yep. we're going to break down the card a little bit, give you our predictions for it. So, Pat, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, what do you want to start with, AEW, NXT? Let's which? go AEW since we're AEW. here. All right, uh, so AEW, uh, for the AEW Championship, you have Kenny Omega taking on Ray Phoenix. Now, this is still continuing the story of the year of Omega, as coaches defined. The year of Omega. And Except, I- or is it the year of Obushi? Well, Ooh. that's also Ooh. just Wrestle Kingdom yeah. just wrapped up. Uh, which was phenomenal as well. So I think there might be a little foreshadowing coming down the road, too, with Could those. Be. Maybe. That's what I'm thinking. But this match should be a lot of fun. Obviously, Kenny Omega is 
relishing the return of the cleaner role. Yeah. Still doing the cross promotion with Impact Wrestling. That he's, sure. He's, de- he's going to be on tonight's show as we're recording. And uh, it's uh, As we record, uh, January 5th, and Meltzer already has – uh, Callus as the promo of the year oh, with this, with the promo that they have for the you know AEW runs into big shows and they run their like their little like mini documentaries yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Callus cuts a promo on there and Melta retweeted and it goes earlier front early front runner for promo of the year and it just Christ Almighty yeah knee it's... slapper I was I was like yep Uncle Dave at it it's not even the new <sighs> year we're already at it you know yeah it's just ridiculous with that. But the match though with him and Ray Phoenix should be a, it should be an instant classic. I'm super excited to see that happen. Yeah, uh, Omega is going to retain because yeah. I, I think as Coach was talking about, I think they're going to be sent off for some big cross promotion. No, they're they're I fully think that this is going to be some sort of like you know the old Ultimo Dragon picture where he's got like 19 belts hanging off of his you know yeah. with his boots his yeah. schmeckle his arms yeah. his, his neck you know that this is what Omega is going to be going for. They're gonna they're yeah. he's going to win the TNA TNA title at some point. And he's going to end up having both belts going against Ibushi at some point. Yeah, I wouldn't be. Omega's going to retain, but I wouldn't be surprised because, as we said, uh, Impact is tonight. You know, AEW's the night after. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some TNA run in and shenanigans uh, during this match. Yeah, I could definitely see something like that happening. Yeah. Uh, next up for the AEW Women's Championship, you have Hikaru Shida taking on Abaddon. Abaddon is supposed to be like Abaddon. their Bray Wyatt type character. She's like a horror zombie type. So she deal. has puppets. Sure. Uh, no, not that far yet. It's just uh, kind of like the rough version. Uh, like, like, think more Walking Dead than gotcha. than that. Uh, so this one, um, I've always said the biggest complaint I have with AEW is the lack of time and devotion to their women's division. Facts. They have a lot of talented uh, females on that roster, and they just don't push them in great storylines. This is another case of that. Uh, Sheeta is now acting very scared of Abaddon. Uh, the fact that we're actually going to get some time in the ring. I do like Sheeta to retain here yeah. and overcoming her fears of Abaddon, but I think this will be a, a quicker match because I think they have bigger stuff lined down the road for Sheeta. Yeah. Uh, next up, you have an eight-man tag match between Matt Jackson, Nick Jackson, Christopher Daniels, and Frankie Kazarian versus Max Caster, Anthony Bowens, Angelico, and Jack Evans. Okay, so they're pushing this new duo known as the Acclaimed, which also had a... Now their promo in the Brody show, if we can go back to that, was dog shit. Yeah, that was that was the one thing of the show where I walked away and I was like, yeah, a little bit too far. Yeah, because I they're supposed to be this edgy rap group, you know, like they cut the rap promo against right. uh, the the young bucks and it got pretty like fourth wall, yeah. you know, breaking, and I'm like, even that was cringeworthy yeah, they, last week they, or two weeks ago. In, in my opinion, I don't think they're exactly ready for primetime. But I understand that they're trying to do something with them and obviously pairing them with the hybrid 2.0. Which also is a dog shit tag team. Yeah. I, I don't – I listen, I'm sorry. I know I've been the, the anti-AEW guy, no, and, I'm, and I'm trying to, to give benefit of the doubt out of respect because of what they did. But the, the I just – the Angelico thing, I, I, ever, I, what, like, what, do, what am I? I'm not. It's not over to me. I don't like it. No, they're just kind of filling space. I think just sure. making the eight man tag. So I mean, I think the I wouldn't doubt the heels winning here. Well, I the the story too is uh, Christopher Daniels, right? Like his pending flirtation with retirement. Yeah, because mm. I mean he is on the other side of fifty, if I'm not mistaken. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I well, I know they had the the uh, what is there Tuesday? Uh, oh, AEW a, Dark. Yeah, they had the. Uh, Kazarian and him versus uh, T2H or whatever. Yeah. And uh, the story was like them beating on Daniels, Kazarian needing to come in to save, couldn't do it. And then Daniels, like, all of a sudden, just like, you know, Super Saiyans up and, and comes back and wins the match to, to yeah. stay on not going to retirement. So I think that's more of the long the story that they're trying to tell here. So. Yeah, I could definitely see the. See, heel, look how up on AEW I am, guys. Yeah, 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 I, I like applaud that. you. Yeah, and I know they're they're slowly breaking up him and Kazarian, so I wouldn't doubt that. that yeah, well, because I think yeah. Kazarian's going to end up going on a singles push, kind of like um, their other. Oh, Scorpio Sky. Yeah, Scorpio Sky. Yeah, I think SCU might be kind of transitioning to the next something. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I what I kind of would like to see maybe uh, the heels win, but almost Kazarian costing the faces to lose. Mm-hmm. You know, that way setting up the split for SCU a little more natural. I'd be okay with that as well. Yeah. 
So we'll kind of have to wait and see, but that should be a fun match. But though. I also said factions need to mean something. So, I mean, <laughs> true. Yeah. I, I don't know. True. Uh, yeah. Next up, you have Cody Rhodes taking on Matt Seidel. Only thing you need to know about this match is Cody's going to have a ton of pyro. <laughs> oh, come on. Hey. Doesn't he always? Hey. <laughs> hey. Come on. That was my number two complaint about come AEW on. this year. Come on. Be nice. No, I this match, um, honestly, it will be. Dude, a, do you think when uh, Baby Rhodes is born? I'm going to be pyro in the delivery room. Be pyro. There'll be pyro for the announcement <laughs> video. Yeah, the, like the, the gender reveal. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> that thing's going to be like the like, dude. They're going to air that on TNT, CNN, HLN, TNT, true. AMC, true. true. CBS might even get on there. I mean, they're going to have all the coverage in the world for the gender reveal. Yeah, that's why I said that's where all the pyro is going to go. It's looking like the Fourth of July. Be. Terrible. But yeah, I know we're we're awful human beings Jesus. about this. But that's if you watch AEW regularly, you know that Cody comes out to pyro for everything. Cody's got more pyro than uh, Ozzy Osbourne ever did for his rock concert. Yeah, course. it's insane. It's like a ten minute pyro entrance for him doing an interview. I just to me, I don't get this match. Like that was the one head scratcher on the card because like Seidel's been pretty much relegated to AEW Dark. Yeah, and they haven't had any interactions. Like they didn't even in the in the rumble thing because Seidel was in that. Like they obviously Cody wasn't, so it's just. I think what they're just trying to do is with Cody, he doesn't really have a good storyline going, but they just want to get him on TV, right? Sure, well, Bob, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, yeah, because like his his one storyline was him and Shaq, but I think that that's up in smoke. He, which I probably think the, fine with the thing that would have made more sense is pairing him with probably like Darby, yeah, in a handicap match with. Team Taz, where Sting comes in and makes the save. See, I, I have this sinking feeling they're lining up Cody versus Sting for later this year. Fuck, don't say uh, that. Uh, no, I, I don't ask me why. I just well, have yeah, I, well, you have that feeling because of their interaction from uh, when Sting debuted. Yeah, because I know Sting wants one more match. I just oh don't want to see it. You know what I really loved on Twitter today, guys? Sorry to, to sidebar here. Was somebody uh, posted about uh, Sting winning the, the uh, AEW title, and somebody replied back and goes, if you're happy about Sting coming back and complaining about Goldberg coming back, go fuck yourself. And it kind of brought a tear to my eye because I was like, that's funny. Yeah. Because if yeah. you are, if you're celebrating Sting but booing Goldberg, you're a tool. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm booing both. So I have all the right in the world. I'll get ready to boo Goldberg through at least 2023. Oh, so, you know. I will boo him for the rest of my life. He's, his contract, he's got to have two matches a year through 2023. My tombstone uh. will say Goldberg sucks. You hear that, Aaron? That's what I want on my tombstone. Goldberg sucks. And fuck Doug Peterson. Fact. Two things. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be like a rotating one. Yes. Like three yes. Just, oh, just man. With some pyro. Yes. And <laughs> that's how we bring it full circle, everybody. <laughs> well played. Cody wins in this yeah. one outright. Next yeah, yeah. Easy. <laughs> yep. uh, and then the last match they have listed is Jack Hager taking on Wardlow. Crazy Curtis Gaming's favorite match of all time. Hmm. Yes. The battle of the inner circle big guys. Dude, Wardlow, our Hager is going to be busting a sweat, and his hair is going to be all over the place. He's probably going to f- touch it more times than uh, Jason Seahorn in that game against the Falcons. Facts. He's going to be flopping that thing all night long. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hager, yeah. shave your head. Yeah. And it's not a problem. Yeah, also also listed out uh, John Moxley is scheduled to return. Chris Jericho's oh, cool. Be, Chris Jericho is going to be on color commentary. Also, I guess Snoop Dogg is uh, set to appear. Uh, this just yeah, in. awkward. This just in. Eminem is going to be uh, showing up on NXT at some point. Yeah, there. Don't doubt that. Oh yeah. Anymore. Well, I mean, I I heard that WWE is not very happy with a Mister Dog no. for appearing on he, said show. He had a line, a couple shirts of on WWE Shop dot com, and I never I never saw, him, but I I saw a post. From somebody about him, you cannot find those shirts on WWE yeah, they, WWE shop. Pulled no. them. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's doing the show, the Go Big Show with Cody. So it's like I understand it, but I'm just like, man, it's not moving the needle for me. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, Moxley's coming back. He just had his big vignette in over New Japan, so maybe we're getting some follow up with that. Or he's going to have something to say about the whole Kenny Omega thing. Either way, yeah. you're going to have a Moxley interview, which is okay. And for overall, like for night one of New Year's Smash, it's not the worst thing in the world. Oh, it's pretty good. I think it'll be a solid one. But in comparison yeah. to New Year's Eve, though, hey, holy shit. Let's break it down, Pat. Yeah, so this is probably going to be your main event. Uh, Finn Balor taking on Kyle O'Reilly uh, <sighs> for the NXT title. <sighs> Round two. Fight. Bring a mouth guard. 
Bring an ice pack. A undisputed air is going to run in and have some shenanigans. I would not be surprised if I, if we see Pete Dunn make a run in. Maybe, maybe Pat McAfee, and he was just Ooh. bullshitting everybody. That um, is totally work. I uh, I told Aaron about this the first one, and she didn't realize like how long Finn wrestled with a broken jaw. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because like, I mean, now think about this real quick for a guy of his stature not not the biggest guy in the world. He is now. Wrestled with a dislocated shoulder, yep, and a broken jaw that needed three plates. Was yep. it for multiple minutes of a match? Yep. Not the oh shit, I broke my jaw. Let's finish this. It was oh shit, I broke my jaw. Let's go another seven to eight minutes. It's absolutely insane. Like, is he the toughest dude in wrestling? Uh yeah, he's in that competition <laughs> right now. It's absolutely wild to see, but I fully think that we're going to have Kyle O'Reilly win the belt. Ooh. I'm convinced of it. Like, I think that their first match last year was an instant five-star classic, legitimate one. Yeah. It was one of the most hardest-hitting matches I have ever seen, uh, this side of Dragunov and um, Walter. And it was just a great match. Yeah. yeah. Like, it was yeah. just, I mean, outside, like, obviously the broken jaw kind of put a little bit of a of a, of a slowdown, you know, yeah. on probably some of the things that they wanted to go for. They still did a hell of a match. Yeah. yeah, this is going to be an absolute epic. I mean, I wouldn't doubt Finn winning, but I just have a feeling Kyle O'Reilly's due after that match. I yeah. think he became a bona fide superstar in WWE's eyes. Sure. So Maybe. to give a switch up for the beginning of the new year, let's see it. I mean, I think Finn's going to retain, but we'll see. I, yeah. I also agree. I think that they want Finn versus... Um, Pete Dunn. No, that, oh, that and the... Walter. Wal, no, not Walter. The other dude that's oh, hanging Cross. around. Cr- Cross, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think yeah, they Karen want Cross that. Cross is out of rematch. Well, he's owed a rematch. He's got the match against Damian Priest, I believe. Too. Uh, yeah, that's the next matchup. Uh, Damian Priest taking on Karrion Cross. Uh, one word for this: Ow. Yeah, this is gonna this be a is hard gonna hit. fucking hurt. I yeah, I think that this is going to be a actually closer match that Cross is going to like. Yeah, this is going to be the first time that we see Cross have somebody press him that we haven't seen since he's been in WWE. I agree. Because yeah. even yeah. the uh, match that he had with Keith Lee, it was. Fairly one sided. It was yeah. pretty much a squash match. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is going to be like Karrion Cross having to do everything in his might to win this match, and it's going to make him just look even more monstrous going into whoever has the title. Yeah, it'll make him look great, and Damian Priest too, because oh, yeah. Damian yeah. Priest has a big future. Even if he takes the loss here, he's still one of the yeah. big guys. Well, that's why it's got to be me. close. He's growing on me. He's yeah. same, same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would say most his, improved. From his last promo year. work. Yeah, Still fast. yeah. That well, last, yeah. that yeah. last, that last. So when he showed up and was silent, I was like, "Oh, let's go." But then oh, yeah. when he started talking, I was like, oh, "Because here's the thing: stop. you ever realized when he was in the Indies, he never really talked, so right? Well, he didn't need to. Yeah, but, but now, that's why. That's why I was like, when he showed up and it was just the he's behind him and like Karen Cross had that look of like like Scarlet saw and was like, uh, you know, Karen, and he was like, oh fuck, yep, that was great. But then as soon as he opened his mouth, I was like, oh, you blew it. Yeah. Just stay, just don't talk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next matchup, again, bring the aspirin, bring the ice pack, because you have Rhea Ripley taking on Raquel Gonzalez in a last woman standing match. Yeah. Ow. This is also going to hurt. <laughs> this whole night's going to hurt. This whole, this, yeah, New Year's Evil is not for the faint of heart. Ripley and Gonzalez have definitely had a hard-hitting feud going on, especially building off war games. I'm not war games. doubting. Yes, war games. I'm not doubting Gonzalez winning this one. No, wouldn't surprise me. I, I I have a very odd feeling that Rhea Ripley's going main roster and she's debuting at the Royal Rumble. Could be. I hope not. I really hope I'm wrong because I think she's better fit in NXT, but wait and see. Yeah, I don't I I I'm picking a lot like well Karen Cross is a heel, so I guess I'm kinda in fins in between, so I'm like So what? so is Rhea Ripley. She's kind of one of those in between. Yeah, I don't know. I I want to go over Kel just because it would be the edgy thing to do, but mm, I yeah. just I feel like they're so like real, you know, especially after the loss to Charlotte, really can't afford another like main match style loss like that to mm. Raquel because Raquel's not at the same level that like a loss to her. I don't think it hurts her stock, but it just doesn't look great. Yeah. You know, I think Rhea's going to retain, but it's not without some shenanigans uh, during the match to really, you know, put her over the top. Yeah, I think you're going to see some run-ins, but I mean, obviously, or some kind of help. I mean, Kansas Little LaRae's yeah, yeah. lurking around there, too, or uh, Dakota, Dakota. I was thinking Dakota. Dakota. Yeah, somebody's going to help her out with that one, so yeah. we can see on that. Uh, and then you have Graham Metalik taking on Santos Escobar for the NXT Cruiserweight title. 
This will be the best pure wrestling match of the night. Uh huh. This is the only one you probably won't need ibuprofen for. Uh, you know that Finn Balor <laughs> Kyle O'Reilly match is going to be pure. It's just going to be Ow. brutal, brutal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, yeah, no, this is the only is, match you don't need an ice pack for. Yeah. Well, they're going to do a lot to try stealing the show. Oh yeah. Say what you will about Escobar because obviously two hundred five live. And the the cruiserweight title it does fall under the radar a lot, but it is great wrestling if you get sure. to watch it. Grand Metal Leak, uh, we usually see him losing a lot as part of Lucha House Party, but True. he can go. He's won. Hasn't he won? Like, didn't he win on Raw? I saw somebody tweet that he. I think he did and in, in lead into this. Yeah, but overall, though, I mean, Lucha is kind of falling apart. It's just kind of the comedy act on the well, main it's roster. Been a, it's been a comedy yeah. act. Yeah, right. But yeah. for this, I think he's going to definitely go out of his way to try having a steel stealing moment. Uh, I like Escobar to retain, though. Yeah. So yeah. kind of wait to see what happens there. Yeah. Yep. And then lastly, uh, Zia Lee and Boa are set to return as well. Uh, for those of you who may not remember or may not know, uh, reading from the preview on WWE.com, uh, quote, after undergoing arduous punishment and training, Zia Lee and Boa are set to return at NXT New Year's Evil. Lee and Boa were taken away by a mysterious man, apparently failing to meet an ultimatum delivered in cryptic letters after Leah came up short in several matches. For weeks, both have been shrouded in secrecy, with the NXT universe seeing only glimpses of their brutal training regimen, led by that same man and another unknown figure looking on. An enigma aside, one thing that's clear is that neither superstar is likely to be the same. What we can expect to see, what can we expect to see when Zia Lee and Boa are back on the black and gold brand this Wednesday night? And might we learn more about the mysterious figures they've been inter, 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 intertwined with? This storyline doesn't move me at all. So weird. Yeah, dude. yeah. The vignette two weeks ago where it was, or it was last week. Yeah, where yeah. it was just them in like a dark lit room, room where she was just punching him and the camera angle was weird like the whole thing was just like this ah, is I it better it better build up to like something super surprisingly revealing because otherwise i'm already checked out I'm right waiting, i'm waiting for someone to go it was me austin it was me yeah it's got to be no it has to have a payoff what if it's Kyrie Zane? i'd be i don't think it will but ooh, what if it's Kyrie Zane? i would mark out you know me i love Kyrie Zane, so it would, the more i could see her the better so like i I think she would, but I think she has bigger plans of like what they're doing over yeah, in, yeah. in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. for because I know NXT Japan is still on the table. Like I just I don't point. know. Like if it's not anything great, and yeah, it's just yeah. like oh hey, it's a random wrestler that we only feature a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, like no thanks. It's got to be something. It's got like, it's like yeah, it's got to be a big payoff or I'm gone. I would hope it would be a big payoff, especially on a night where it's very well stacked. Yeah, yeah. like you don't show this unless you've got. Well, I mean, they could be it could be a letdown. So, but you, I feel like they don't do this unless they've got something. No, NXT has a reputation. Body. Like right, when they yeah. do events, they do events. So we'll have to wait and see on that. Either way, it's a stack night of wrestling. Wednesday night, hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. What are you going to be watching? What is your thoughts? Who's going to have the best night of all? We definitely want to have that conversation, so definitely hit us up. Let us know. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Sunny Hepburn. And I'm Brandy Fleets. And we're from Book Book of Lies, Lies, the podcast, where we discuss liars, cheats, and thieves, scammers, and dirty, rotten scoundrels. You can tune in for new episodes every Tuesday to hear about another lowdown, dirty liar. And learn how to spot them. So that's Book of Lies Podcast. You can connect with us on social media, Twitter at Book of Lies Pod, Facebook and Instagram at Book of Lies Podcast. Bye. Hey, this is Johnny Moose from Excite Wrestling, and you're listening to the ODPH. I didn't mess it up. I thought I would. Right now, back to the guys. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Time to talk local minutes. I know. There is a bit of a local minute update with the Binghamton Devils. Uh, as you, Bummer. Yeah, as many of you might have heard, the AHL season will be going forward. Uh, they will be following in the same vein that the NHL is doing, where it's kind of like regional uh, division, so only you know same, team, same teams in the same area playing each other. Uh, works out for Binghamton because I don't have the list in front of me, but it's our old division where, where it's like Hershey, Scranton, Syracuse, uh, uh, Rochester. So it's, it's the division if you're a Binghamton Devils fan or a fan. Except. 
Yeah, except uh, the Binghamton Devils the news came down will not be playing in Binghamton. Uh, it was announced uh, just yesterday as we record uh, this from an uh, article on WBNG.com. That's our local news station here. Uh, quote, the Binghamton Devils will play the 2020-21 season in Newark, New Jersey. The B-Devils will play at the Prudential Center, which is the home of the New Jersey Devils. According to the AHL website, the B-Devils are one of four teams who will play at different locations this season. B-Devils Vice President of Operations Tom Mitchell said the decision came from New Jersey and boiled down to the economics of the situation and COVID. Quote, with the ice in the building in Newark, in Newark already in the Prudential Center and the COVID testing equipment and personnel space, personnel in place, which is very expensive, it made more sense to New Jersey to do it that way than try to do it up here, uh, Mitchell said. Mitchell said the B-Devils organization will shift its attention toward planning the 2021-22 season. Uh, that, was the that was the decision that was made, and we have to live with it and get focused on October of 21 and hopefully get back to some normalcy. Uh, so yeah, B doubles, unfortunately will not be playing here in Binghamton, uh, this upcoming year, which I know sucks. And I know a lot of people are upset about it. Sure. But, but makes sense. given the circumstances, right. uh, there was no way they were going to let fans in attendance. For no, I know they, yeah, we were, our area has been ups and downs as far as number of cases and everything yeah. and yeah. on Cuomo's radar and off. So like, yeah, there, there was no, yeah. As much as I want to see hockey back here in Binghamton and go to a B devils game, cause Christ, it's been way too long at this point. Mm -hmm. It it wasn't going to happen. It'd be a nice touch if somehow we they were able to to I don't know close circuit the games to us or something. They might. Just some you know nice little the AHL touch. Might, the AHL might work. Something AHL out. TV isn't that so something? Yeah, that's, but yeah, uh, that's still a it's thing. a pay for play yeah. subscription. So yeah, I, I mean, well, and, I, and, I, and I know a couple of games each year are on TV through MSG or some nonsense. Like I'm, that. I'm sure that they'll try doing something they'll to accommodate the fans. Jersey up will here. figure something. But out. but here's the thing. I mean, obviously we we are still coming in and living in the COVID era. So we have to adapt to what's happening. Yeah. And obviously this is a smart play to do as much as it sucks. Safety and health come first. Yeah. So that's why we have the internet folks. We will watch the game somehow. Mm hmm. So let us round those bases, shall we? Yeah, so uh, I'll start off. Of course, uh, the uh, NFL season is over, so the coaching carousel has already begun. I'm uh, going to read through a list of some folks that are fired, some that were just fired, some that were previously fired that you might have forgotten about. Uh, so get your pen and paper ready to keep track. Uh, the, of course, the Houston Texans fired Bill O'Brien, still yet to hire anybody. Uh, obviously, they'll probably be looking at Eric Benemy with uh, Kansas, from Kansas City, among many others. Uh, the Fal Atlanta Falcons fired Dan Quinn. Uh, the um, Detroit Lions fired Matt Patricia. The New York Football Jets finally fired Adam Gase. Finally. Yeah, should have happened months ago. Uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars parted ways with Doug Marone. Uh, and supposedly, from what I was saw on Reddit through a, a flight tracker, there was a private jet that took off from Columbus, Ohio, and landed at the airport down in Jacksonville. Mm. Uh, whether that was who you think it is or not, I don't know. But, yeah. hey, it's what I read. Uh, the uh, Los Angeles Chargers uh, parted ways with Anthony Lynn. Uh, and then the one we do know is returning, uh, Zach Taylor is staying with the Cincinnati Bengals. All right. Well, I mean, nothing really too shocking there, no. I would say. Uh, Jack well, shocking is that Adam Gates took until the end of the season he got fired. Yeah, well, that one we, we knew was all but coming. I mean, I think that, that was a lock of anything. Uh, no they let him fly home. That was a plus. Yeah, yeah no real leap there. I mean, Anthony, no. Anthony Lynn in, in the Chargers. I think would be the most enticing job out there. Oh yeah, because they do have all the parts to right. to go. Oh yeah, so they're probably the most polished. Jason Garrett, Garrett's been requested for an interview for that job, as I talked about already. Yeah, yeah, so I can see it. I could definitely see him going out there, especially when you got Herbert as your quarterback. I mean, yep. you got a Not lot. Bad. You have a lot of upside. The only thing with Jacksonville, though, they got the number one draft pick, so you could have Trevor Lawrence, Urban Meyer associated with that job early on. Yeah, that's the hot so, rumor like said, right now. Like I said, but, the, the flight tracker website, uh, private jet took off from Columbus, Ohio, landed in in Jacksonville, and that was today. Yeah, but like I said, I think if Jacksonville was smart, they'd talk to Eric Benemy and then get him there, and then really let him go and do something with the ship. But either way, it's still the, the coaching carousel continues. We'll be monitoring it as the season progresses. Yep. Coach, I hate bringing this up, but... You know, I'm just going to touch on it because obviously, we, you know, NFL kind of uh, grabbed our attention with everything that happened on Sunday. But the uh, National College football playoffs were played. Uh, Alabama, uh, unfortunately, did take it to Notre Dame, 31-14. Uh, uh, although the score does look close, uh, it was closer than I thought say. it would be for a while. Yeah, yeah, you know, not so much, Pad, but thank you. Um, you know, yeah. they uh, the the back breaking moment that really just 
grinded my gears was Notre Dame was down at one point twenty one to seven. Yep. And uh they were driving the ball fairly efficiently and it got to uh, a third and or second long situation with the second Ian, and fifteen, I think. Yeah, with Ian Book running outside the pocket on a play action pass that he was trying to hit. Uh, t- uh, I think Michael Mayer, the tight end, mm-hmm. and unfortunately the ball kind of sailed on him a little bit. Uh, Dalen, I think it was Dylan Moss, actually made a great play, uh, made the interception on the ball, and essentially broke Notre Dame's back as Alabama ended up going on that drive, scoring, going up 28-7, to and it was just too much to come back from. Uh, just again, it's like I said, going into the game. It's, Notre Dame didn't have the firepower to match uh, you know, this, this Alabama offense. And honestly, you know what? To all the people that were like, oh, Notre Dame doesn't deserve to be there, whatever, Alabama would have beaten Cincinnati 56 to nothing. They would have beaten te- Texas A&M 75 to nothing. That offense is Devontae, scary. Devontae Smith is the Slim Reaper name fits because mm-hmm. the dude's scary. Um, and you know what? I, I, I'm proud that Notre Dame got in. I'm happy that Notre Dame got in. And, and I'm glad that they showed up and didn't get schlacked. And now, you know, uh, then the next game, Ohio State absolutely decimated, yeah. decimated Clemson. You think, must have heard the show. I was going to say, you think Fields was here in that show? Yeah. Because, uh, my God, that, I mean, Trevor Lawrence did not look the same. You know, I'm watching the game, you know, with my Ohio State fan wife. Uh, and, it, I, I, you know, I watch a lot of college football, watched a lot of Clemson this year, saw what he did in Notre Dame, and he just, he wasn't the same. He was not the same player that he was in the ACC championship game. I, I, I'm not saying anything like an injury or anything. It's just Ohio State's defense obviously found something that is, you know, a glitch in the system in the matrix because Trevor Lawrence just couldn't compute. He looked very human. Yeah, he looked he looked very lost in whatever Ohio State was doing. I mean, it's not like I went back and like broke down the tape because it's too painful for me to watch. Um, but if you went back and watched it, I guarantee you there were some looks that they weren't expecting Ohio State to do, um, and and they did it. And offensively, you know, the thing that I said again is Clemson's defense is good but not great, and Ohio State took shots down the field. Uh-huh. And they're going to have to do that again against Alabama if they want to stay in that game. And I think they can beat Alabama. I'm not going to say that's my official pick. Because <laughs> I was going to say, you're crazy if you say that. Well, yeah, no, because no cause here's, a, here's the two takeaways I have from the game. Because I, I was rooting for you for Notre Dame. Sure. I think the backbreaking moment was the hurdle. Nah, the hurdle was the the hurdle. That was a tempo changer. No, no, it was, and it was a big play. But again, that only brought it to that. That happened after the interception on that drive. Mm -hmm. So like, it it wasn't because they were. Notre Dame was driving the ball. I mean, it was twenty-one to seven. Like, right? You score a touchdown on that drive. Now you're twenty-one fourteen, and and everything opens up. Um, But the hurdle. The interception, you know, the fact The interception that, was the nail in the coffin. Yeah, the, yeah, well, the interception what came first. Then it was the leap. So, I mean, the the, the leap was oh, definitely the okay. icing. Yeah, the because it was on that drive that he got outside and, and made the... So, it, it was the icing on the cake. You know, I think that's what finally, like... It's just, again, the Notre Dame's inability to make the uh, explosive play offensively, you know, to... to to drive because their game plan going in was definitely we need to control the ball we need to control the clock Mm -hmm. but the problem is Alabama's so decisive and just precision offensively that they just drove right down the field you know I mean no matter what Notre Dame did there was no way they were going to stop that offense and the only way to compete with that is not ball control it's point for point. Yeah, you gotta go yeah you gotta go gunsling with it. You got you gotta throw. Yeah but I think for Justin Fields though he had a little chip on his shoulder, I think. Oh, for sure. And he wanted to play. So I think if he can recreate that magic against Alabama, it's going to be tough. Yeah. It's not all the rum of thought. Like, I think Alabama is going to win. I just don't want to say it out loud and put that energy out in the world. <laughs> I mean, but, but it's hard to pick against the, the – I mean, it's like picking against the Patriots with the, the Brady-Belichick era. Like, the, I hate saying it, but – Alabama currently uh, favored by 7.5. The thing is, is, like, you take away the pass, then Najee Harris is going to kill you. You stop Najee Harris, they're just going to throw it. Like, yeah. Ohio State um, is very good offensively, and Bama's defense I'm, – I'm, I swear on this. I don't care what they did to Notre Dame. Their defense is not good. It's just Notre Dame does not have the skill talent that – these other elite teams have. Mm -hmm. So Ohio State's going to be able to score. It's just the difference is I don't think that they're going to be able to stop Alabama like they did Clemson. Yo, the over-under on this is 75. (laughs) 
Oh, that I believe it's going to be shootout. Take yeah. the over. That, well, that's why I'm Take saying. Take the like, over. This is going to be a point for point. We need to score. Anything less than a touchdown is going to be a stop this is going type to be, game. This is going to be a shootout and a little bit of clock management. And then clock by clock management, I mean, you manage the clock to where you have the ball last. It'll be a fun game, right? Though. Yeah, no, this is, this is, I mean, the Clemson matchup against Bama would have been good, but they don't have the defense that... Uh, the, the defensive skill set that uh, the speedsters on the outside. Like, I mean, Patrick Sertain's a real deal. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, his dad taught him very well. Oh, yeah, he, yeah he's, he he's a prototype. Absol- he absolutely shut down McKinley. He was absolutely taken out of the game, which was, I definitely think, Alabama's game plan and um, is a force to be reckoned with. I mean, when you take one side of the field away, Revis Island, everybody, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you effectively take away, you know, what the offense can do. And that's what Sertan can do, and that's what he'll do uh, with Ohio State with uh, their wide receiver that they have. It'll be very interesting. I think Alabama runs a lot of the same offense San Francisco does for 49ers. Yeah. They do a little yeah. sweep end arounds. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that they, they want to get, you know, Alabama and Sarkeesian Skirkaz- Sar- understands where are my talented players because, again, I it's it's not that I think Mac Jones is talentless. It's just he's not the focal point of the offense like Tua was, you know, or mm. like uh, Hertz was the year before. It's the wide receivers that's like, all right, we need to get the ball to these guys in space. And how do you do that? End arounds, sweeps, that type of stuff, because you get them out on the edges, and then it's one on one with them versus the defensive end, and they're going to win that every time. Yeah. Still be a fun one to watch when the game goes down, though. So yeah. we'll, we'll definitely have a little more to say about when it gets closer. And I, for me to close the show out, I know we're not doing locks and leaves, but I'm going to read off the playoff schedule for the NFL this week. Yep. And I want the panel to give me that lock. Okay. We're, not, we're not talking leaps because, I mean, leaps you can really kind of stretch here. So as we kick off January 9th and 10th, we have the wild card weekend, as it's called. Kansas City and Green Bay are not playing. So kicking off. The NFC list is New Orleans is going to be hosting Chicago to an eight seed. That's four o'clock on Sunday. Saints are favored eight and a half. Mm. Seahawks are going to be hosting the LA Rams. So it's division four forty start on Saturday. Seahawks are favored four and a half. And Washington is going to be hosting Tom Brady and company on Saturday night eight p.m. Bucks are favored seven and a half. That's going to go up between now and Sunday. Oh, absolutely. Or Saturday, I should say. Looking at the AFC, uh, kicking off Saturday action is those Buffalo Bills, which will have fans in attendance. Mm-hmm. Hashtag get the tables. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a wild time up at the Ralph. I still call it the Ralph. I, I don't pray care what for snow. Says. Pray for a lot of snow. Yeah, uh, they're going to be hosting the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, so that's going to be uh, one o'clock on Saturday, kicking off the weekend. Bills are favored six and a half. The over-under, though, is 51. I think that's a little high, but that's just me. Yeah, maybe. All right, next up is the Steelers. They're going to be hosting the Cleveland Browns in a deja vu match from last week. Uh, they're going to be uh, Sunday night, 8 p.m., if I'm reading this correctly. 8 15, yep. 8 15, yep. Which uh, the Steelers are favored three and a half. And closing out the weekend is Tennessee hosting Baltimore. One o'clock on Sunday, Ravens are favored four and a half. So, gentlemen, starting with Coach, who's your lock for the weekend? The Bills. Oh, Ooh, God bless your heart. Right. Uh, my lock is Tampa Bay. I'll even give you a leap I because I, I think Cleveland's going to beat Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. Shock of the weekend. I, I'm down for that. Uh, my lock, I'm, I'm going Tampa Bay too. I, I do think Buffalo will win, but I always hate betting on my team, so to speak, and, and putting that karma off. Because the thing is, they got to stop Taylor and the run game at Indianapolis. If they can do that, they can definitely win that game outright. It just that run defense has to go in there. They put the shellacking on Miami. So I almost hate rooting against Indianapolis because they took that spot. So we'll kind of make that happen. But definitely let us know what you think. And that being said, the music you heard on this episode of the ODPH is that of Brian Wolf. Now, he does a Patreon pad. Is that correct? This is true. He does a lot of music on Wednesdays. He's doing his Patreon concerts on Facebook and social media. Where do you find out about that, Pad? OchoDuroParleyHour.com. That's right. So you head on over to the music section. You can check out all the things that are going on with Brian, Second Suitor, Tom Jolu, Floodlands, Shot of the Robots, and all the great music you hear on the ODPH. You can also head on over to the website and check out the directory, which we have friends of the show, such as Tom from Off the Cuff Gaming, Excite Wrestling, Dragon Master Games, and Organizational Link Support and Black Lives Matter. We also have all the links via Podchaser to all the pod groups we're in. Because let's face it, Pad, what do I say every week? If you're not on Podchaser, are you really in a pod group? Nope. Exactly. So you got to have that page. So you'll find six up there, if I'm doing my math right. So you find the ones for Pod Nation, the Legion Independent Podcast, the Apocalypse, Alternate Reality Radio, 
hashtag 607 podcast and 812 pro, 8122 productions yeah i had to think about that for if a second your math is right and you're not doing steiner math yes because you know 33 percent of this and yeah I, I can't even try doing steiner math but we definitely want to shout out our guys over at 8122 productions rich ron mike c and hashtag big natty cool still on twitter oh boy and if you want that cobra kai talk you have to hit up diesel at big natty cool because he will break it down to you like no man I have seen. He is like the Matrix when it comes to Cobra Kai. It is impressive. So definitely want to check out what they got cooking up. And if you want to sign up for their Patreon, $1 gets you in the door. $3 gets you a comfy seat at the table. And you can have all the Dr. Derek you can handle. Enough said there. Also on the webpage, we have to plug because we have a sale coming on too for the T Public store. Ooh. So definitely want to get that ODPH swag. And we might have some more shirts coming. Who knows? Tees dot dot dot. You can find that out there on the page as well. Links to the Twitch channel. So much is on ODPH webpage you need to make sure you bookmark it and definitely select ochodoropolyaro.com the next time you're surfing the web. Check it out. That's all I got for this week. So on behalf of your coach, my coach, the coach, Coach Duffy, who is on his way to 8122 Productions to recount the votes for Locks and Leaps. He is that fired up about it. Rich, get ready. He's coming to the new studio to do a recount. For the one and only Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time.